Hello, friends, and welcome to the Games Done Quick Hot Fix. My name is Smooth Operative, and you are watching Time Capsule. It is a show where we travel back in time to your favorite years in gaming and showcase awesome speedruns of games released in the same year. Tonight on the show, we are reliving some of our favorites from the year 2001 with games including Zone of the Enders, Luigi's Mansion, and later, Yu-Gi-Oh! The Duelists of Roses. So listen, friends, we've got giant mechs, spooky mansions, and yes, we may even see a blue-eyes white dragon tonight. But as always, before we begin the fun, let's cover some announcements. First off, GDQ is headed back to PAX this year, and we sincerely hope you will join us at PAX East 2024. We will be holding a special speedrun marathon live at PAX East from March 21st through the 24th. So to all of my speedrunners out there watching, Submissions are open from now through February 29th. You can use the command exclamation mark PAX in our Twitch chat for more information or go to paxeast.gamesdonequick.com to submit your runs. And don't forget to mark your calendars next month for March 3rd through the 10th because GDQ's Frame Fatales are back with the all women and femme speedrunning event we all know and love, Frost Fatales. And the schedule is now out so you can use the command exclamation mark FF in Twitch chat for those links. Prize submissions are also open from now until February 28th. Go to gamesdonequick.com slash frame fatales for more information. All right, that's all I have for you right now. So let's get this started, shall we? Our next runner just got a world record for Zone of the Enders, and I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you to him. Please welcome the one, the only, Plywood. Thank you very much, Tippy. Hi, everybody. <laughs> that was that was that was great. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Flywood. So happy to have you back. Tell tell us uh, the plan. Uh, brief us on the mission tonight. Right. So we are going to be speedrunning Zone of the Enders, which originally came out on PlayStation Two, fairly close to the launch of the console. Uh, this is a high speed robot action game from Konami. Yes. With a uh, production help <laughs> from Hideo Kojima himself. Uh, and if you've never seen this game before, think of it sort of like a brawler, but a uh, very fast pace with robots and lasers and kablooey in the future. Um, it's a very fun, quick game. Uh, if you've never seen this game before and you're interested in it, highly recommend giving it a go. You'll finish it in like a weekend, if that. It's very quick, as you'll <laughs> see. Quick one. So we're going to be running any percent easy tonight. So we're going to be going as fast as possible on the lowest difficulty. Uh, I have all the records in this game. Been working on this game on and off for the past year and a half or so. So it's fun to come back to it every once in a while and see what we can improve on. And thankfully, we have some new strats for all of you tonight. Uh, getting in preparation for this run. So I can actually kind of thank Tippy for helping me get this world record because <laughs> it got the creative juices flowing. So oh, thank, yeah, you. thank you for having me. So uh, we're going to be playing as Leo here, who is a scared boy in a war zone, essentially, that has uh, started on his colony. And uh, he finds himself in this incredible mech called Jehuti, and he has to deliver this mech off the colony, out of the war zone, to uh, essentially be part of the resistance against the uh, warring force, Barum. It's the basic uh, gist of the plot. So Yeah, he's got work to do. He's got some work to do. We'll get it done in, like, under 20 minutes, uh, you know, give or take. <laughs> 20-ish minutes. All right. Well, whenever you are ready, Plywood. Okay. Run starts in three, two, one, go. Good luck. Thank you. So we have our first enemy right here, which is a raptor. We're going to be seeing those raptors throughout the run. There's three basic enemy types in this game, the raptors, the mummies, and the cyclops. So... And they also have levels associated with them, and as they increase in their level, their AI gets better, so they're more likely to dodge our attacks and be annoying, but level 1s are usually a little dumb. So hopefully we get a fast track here with the dash shot. 
nice. So nice finish on that mummy head with the shield. And we do our first boss fight. Throw Viola into the wall real quick and we're out of there. So what you're gonna see me do is approach these uh, the program. these program spots. They're basically chests. We have to collect various things throughout the levels. That allowed us to use the main menu, by the way. So we have to improve our mech by interacting with the world. Oh, we just got a beautiful, beautiful glitch that can happen both on the HD and PS2 version. The burst shot that I just fired, that big blast, uh, just flew through the raptor. And that can just happen. There's nothing you can do about it. And uh, what we try to do is get to those chests to get those programs without having to fight enemies we don't want to fight. Uh, you know, there's cycles that we're trying to hit. And sadly, I missed that cycle because that shot missed. And we're into the actual first first boss with a health bar. We're just going pew, pew, pew. There's nothing too exciting about this. Just chain together these burst shots. I'm looking at his hand, Jet Hootie's hand going over the shoulder as my cue to uh, go for the next shot. So we're gonna do something for some marathon safety, just a little insurance policy. Uh, we're going to pick up a sub weapon here that actually heals us. And this might save my life later, so it's just a nice little detour, a little seven second detour for some insurance later on. Okay. So what we're gonna do here is throw a burst shot at a commander. And the commander in a, in a unit, um, if they go down, the rest of their unit has one HP. So it's very easy to take them out. But you want to take out the commander first, which is shown by the asterisk next to the level. So that was a very clean execution. We are now going to get the sniper rifle so we can snipe these little nodes on this tower. And in order to do that, we're going to play a little game of billiards or pool, shooting these floating jars, Ooh. hopefully very expertly. Some long distance burst shotting here. Eh, just a little bit off. Got that one though. It's okay though. You were kind of on a timer here anyways. Maybe I'll be able to get this without getting hit. We'll see. No, that's okay. So if you get into an encounter, you can just run away like that. Obviously, we'd rather not hit that if we could, but it's no big deal. It's just a few seconds of time loss. So cool thing about the HD version is the sniping is completely broken. So we can shoot when we really shouldn't be able to. Like I'm shooting through the tube. It's not supposed to be like that but they didn't program the collision correctly when you're shooting really far distance with the sniper rifle. So you save, uh, like, I don't know, seven seconds over PS2 with that. For the most part, though, the PS2 version and the HD version that we're seeing right here on Xbox is pretty similar. There's not too many differences besides the faster load times and that sniping I just mentioned. So our next goal is to take down these satellites, but we can't go through that, uh, go down into that underground area because there's a microwave that we have to get past. Now we're gonna fight these Cyclops. This is actually a bit of a scary fight. We could, they could easily gang up on us and uh, chain throw us, but thankfully it went pretty well. They're kind of like boxers, those Cyclops, so we try to like bait them into punching us and then back up while shielding to avoid taking too much damage. Okay, so now we are heading back to town one where we fought a uh, Tempest. We're going to be doing a strategy here with the mummies where we're going to change our target at the very last second to avoid them uh, countering the attack with their beam. And hopefully it'll work out okay. So you see I shift it right at the last second and they can't intercept it. They don't know it's coming. There we go. So 
So we got our two passcodes. You'll see me take out, take on uh, certain groups, and that gives me parts of like a password to open up those chests with the uh, programs that I need. So that's why we're. I, generally speaking, we try not to fight at all, but sometimes we do need to fight. Uh, we try to keep our fighting to a minimum in this run. If we were doing 100%, we'd have to be fighting more enemies so we could get some of the sub-weapons. 100% run, by the way, is 1.5 times longer. <laughs> but it's a short game, yes. so... <laughs> <laughs> but what can you expect, yeah, with a short game? Naturally. You're going to see me use the throw here. Very useful, especially if enemies are near walls, to throw them into the walls. But sometimes we're we're just kind of fighting in space in the area, not near uh, walls, but in this uh, tunnel area, it's very easy to do that. This movement is really weird. Uh, something you're probably noticing is that the camera seems like I'm not really doing a whole lot. It's just just resetting on its own. And the way the camera controls in this game is pretty unique. It's not really how most games these days would control. You know, most games with a controller, third person action game, you're controlling the camera with your right stick. You can do that in this game, but it's not really what you're supposed to do. You let the camera reset when you let go of your movement. So that's why sometimes it's going to look like I'm flying in a very weird way. And the camera's not resetting, and that's why. Another nice throw setup. Sadly, sometimes we get those random repairs that heal us. Uh, if you're playing on very hard, those don't happen, which is both a blessing and a curse since you die so quickly. But on the lower difficulties, <laughs> it's just a, another fun RNG element to this run. Oh, yeah. All right. We are coming back to town, too, because we need to take a downed raptor and take control of it. But here, we're going to pick up the sniper pickup. And what that does is it interrupts Ada's dialogue, which is our onboard computer. So sometimes when Ada's talking, she's telling you about the battle position, your health, all kinds of stuff. And that can actually interrupt our ability to progress in cutscenes. But if I pick up that sniper ammo now, it stops her from interrupting uh, about, hey, there's damage to the area. They're attacking the area. So it's a nice little way to interrupt her and not have to deal with bad luck. Now that we're controlling the raptor, I'm going to be using things that you're not going to see normally, uh, like that little attack with all those lights, light beams coming out. That's called the geyser. And you can use that to stun the enemies and get set up for nice damage. So try to use our new toolkit as well as we can to get through the game faster. So I just set that up as I'm coming into the room. Hopefully get a good setup. Sadly, this guy is not playing ball. Camera, please. Stop punching me! All right, we're good. The camera is like its it own is, character it, it, at this point. It is. <laughs> this is zone of the enders. Also, you need to think about your camera zone too. I think it's a little, a little wacky sometimes. <laughs> don't don't ignore the camera zone, okay? The cameraman is having a heck of a time flying around trying to track. <laughs> I, I think of like Lakitu in Super Mario sixty four. Like, if Lakitu is in this game, I think Lakitu would be really scared. He'd be like, where do I go? <laughs> move, can't this cloud move any faster? Exactly. So we're coming back in here. The uh, raptor we were just controlling got a program that allows it to see invisible things, like the crack in the wall we bursted through. And we need that program, so we're coming back to take out the raptor we were just controlling. You know, it's like, I taught you all you need to know, Raptor, and now, as your master, I must I must destroy you to get my goods back. So, we got our detector, and now we are heading to the mountain, supposedly, but we're actually going to get shot down and get a virus on Jehuti. 
which will leave us with one HP until we cure the virus with a vaccine program. So that's fun. Gosh, where, where do we pick up the vaccine program? I'm glad you asked. We're actually going to go where Jehuti was built <laughs> on this colony to oh. get the vaccine program and hopefully not die with our one HP. Got to do that uh, factory reset. Exactly. Exactly. So we're going to snipe again. We need to snipe some porter jars instead of using our burr shot. So we just pace out our shots here. The auto aim is very forgiving, but you still need to be aiming generally at the target. And you really have to be careful that you do not snipe the groups because the auto aim could aim at the groups and then they're going to fly at you from, you know, a kilometer away. They will fly at you and try to attack you. So we really don't want to do that. <laughs> Certainly not. Okay, very good. So that's that's the one fight we have to do while at 1 HP. And yes, that can kill you. It is killed runs on easy. It's no joke. But thankfully we are done with that. And we are going to pick up something that says unknown and we will know what it is later, but this is ammo for something that we need to fight the next boss. We have obtained the item. Okay, so now we're going to City 2, and I'm going to be quiet for this banger of a song. Nice. So we're picking up uh, parts of a passcode. You have to do one more set of fights here. Hopefully we do not get trolled this time with the burst shot. Hey, we didn't. That's great. That one didn't work. That's okay. So this is actually a place where you want the repair drop, the random repair drop, because then I could set myself up right by that group and get a uh, nice burst slash and hit them all at once. But, you know, sometimes you just don't get the luck you need. That's just the nature of this game. That's okay, though. We are now heading back to Factory 2, and we're going to get the uh, decoy program so we can use that ammo we picked up earlier. A lot of things happen real fast, folks. Gotta, gotta keep up the pace. It's a fast-paced, high-octane game. <laughs> we gotta make our escape. Yeah, we, you know? we don't have time to mess around. We have obtained the passcode, okay? Ada will try to keep you guys updated, but uh, I can only do so much. The level five Raptors are very annoying. My general strategy is, as I approach them is to do a shooty shooty pew 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 and then uh, do a triple slash into a burst slash. And generally speaking, you get good results with that, but nothing is guaranteed in this game. There's better approaches and worse approaches, but there's always going to be some amount of luck to most of these fights. All right, so here's Tyrant. We're supposed to use decoys to avoid this, this uh, like, light, light beam attack that it does. But you don't need to do it for the first one. And we want to save our decoys because they are really, really useful, as you will see later on. Phase two. Get up on its arm, do two burst shots, and we're done. No problem. Nice. It's so satisfying watching the burst shot. It's like, boom. boom. I know. They made them less OP <laughs> in, in the sequel because they're really like, you oh, I see. That is just our bread and butter <laughs> in this game. It's just dunking on those other mechs. Yeah, and the sequel, which is a fantastic game. Um, you actually, like, you charge the burst shot to make it bigger and bigger so that it does more damage rather than this game. is just, like, max damage <laughs> immediately. <laughs> so decoys here are going to make all these enemies distracted. Uh, they last for about five seconds or until they destroy it. And, uh, and we're not going to go for that. Um... 
It's going to be very useful against these enemies because they basically become defenseless, more or less, as long as they are focused on the uh, decoy. Oh, don't don't dodge out of the way. Okay. It's cool when they deflect. Like, wow, they parry. That's so cool. But it's a big waste of time. Oh, okay. Another really good place to go for throws. So the walls are right next to us in this uh, canyon. And now we do another decoy and hopefully take out this commander. Nice. And off we go to Nebula. It's a pretty technical, demanding fight. Very tight timing on some of this stuff. Very nice. That is a tight timing uh, to get those shots into the burst shot. I'm going to try and go for the hardest strat here, folks. We'll see if we can do it. Perfect. That is the fastest you can yeah, do phase let's one. Go. Let's go, Plywood. Yes. It's telling us to talk to Mommy, but I'm actually a little bit busy here throwing bird shots. So with, <laughs> with phase two, it's pretty easy, but if you mess up the timing on this first shot, he throws the kitchen sink at you, so you really don't want to mess oh, wow. this up. No, that would be painful, I think. Okay, so remember that fight we did at the start? Yeah, she's back, and uh, she's actually really scary. Phase one is no big deal, but we're going to try and chain throw Viola here or Nate. She can do so many different things. She's basically like us, so. Well done. Our attacks do a lot of damage. That's why I brought Mummy just in case. Try to throw her into the boxes. Nice. Beautiful. Well done. Yeah, well done. Yeah. That fight looks easy. I assure you, it is not. <laughs> Sometimes it really doesn't feel easy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, she's leveled up quite a bit yeah. since the last time we she, saw her. Uh, <laughs> she just kind of let us get away with with it last time. Not so much there. So we're supposed to be defusing these bombs, but on easy, you can shoot them for some reason, uh, which is a lot faster than defusing. The thing is, is it, it takes out 75% of our health. So this whole sequence is a very tricky balancing act of our health and pacing out the attacks while trying to uh, keep up with the uh, the timing of the uh, bombs. Okay, I'm going to focus on... So I'm going to mummy here just for safety. Okay. That level 5 is... Can be very annoying. Here's a level six, but he's just as silly when it comes to the decoys. Heal up a little bit, and we're gonna fight Volo one more time because our pilot was like, I'm not gonna kill you, I don't wanna kill anyone. And now she's back to be like, You should have killed me. So thankfully, it's a little bit more easy because her. Mech is so screwed up to a uh, chain thrower. And, and now we fight Anubis. And by fight Anubis, I mean, wait a minute, because you can't fight Anubis. You do that in the sequel. So this is actually the end of the run. Wow. <laughs> you're, you're leaving us wanting more plywood. When's the, the Zone of the Enders 2 run, huh? That's a good question. <laughs> that, that is a very good question. But I <laughs> see there's some really great zone of the other two uh, zone of the enders two 
the second runner runners. That is a mouthful. Um, that, that is, wow. It is. Um, but this game doesn't get as much love, and, you know, I've been uh, having fun with just running through this game real fast. So maybe some point, but I have too much fun running I mean, this. Yeah. Join the slot machine of got... battles. Uh, time is <laughs> I coming up by the watching way. this game. Yes, sure. Time. Nice, GG. I was saying I love watching this game because somehow Zone of the Enders was a game I was exposed to uh, back back in two thousand one, and it just mesmerized me. So seeing you go through this plywood and just Nailing everything. Absolutely amazing to see. Thank you so much. Do you have any uh, shout outs, comments, anything you want to say? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So want to uh, shout out some of my fellow Zone of the Enders one runners, Sephiro Crescent and uh, Tapioca, who uh, helped me as I was starting this game, gave me a lot of uh, info from watching their runs and getting an idea of how this run goes. Of course, uh, shout out to Tippy for uh, having me do this <laughs> run and uh, giving me a nice, yes. fun incentive to come back and try to improve this run. Um, yeah, I uh, and thanks to everyone who's watching and all the people behind the scenes who help make uh, these streams possible. It really is only possible with the support of production and the viewership that shows like this can happen. So I really want to thank all of you for that, of course. Um, Absolutely. If you want to watch some of my world record runs, you can find me on YouTube, Plywood Gaming, and you can uh, check out my streams here occasionally happening on Twitch at forward slash plywood underscore. Uh, it's always fun running this game and being able to show it off. It's one of those games that is near and dear to nostalgia for me. I remember playing this <laughs> and its sequel quite a bit as a kid. So uh, do check it out if you are ever interested. You can play it on uh, Xbox One or Series. You can't play the um, Zone the Enders 1 on PS5 or PS4, unfortunately. Only only ah. the sequel. Um you can't play it on PS3. We'll take but what we can get. It's the worst version, sadly. Um, <laughs> sadly, sadly. We love our PS3s, but... But yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. You know, um, for those of you who didn't know, Pl Plywood's actually one of the first people I met in the speedrunning community, so having him here really meant a lot to me. Plywood, thank you so much for being here, seriously. Um, and uh, those of you watching, if you did enjoy the run, make sure you follow Plywood here on Twitch as well, uh, twitch.tv slash plywood underscore. Now, before we break, a big thank you to all of our wonderful supporters. Your subs, Prime Gaming subs, gift subs, and bits cheered here on the GDQ Twitch channel help support the Games Done Quick Hotfix. So if you do enjoy watching this show, Time Capsule, or any of our other Hotfix shows, consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, you can learn more about everything Hotfix at gamesdonequick.com slash hotfix. And uh, to my incredibly organized extroverts out there, Games Done Quick is looking for a new mainline event coordinator, volunteer coordinator. So if that position intrigues you, make sure to review the responsibilities and apply on our website at gamesdonequick.com slash jobs. Uh, again, Plywood, thank you so much for being here. We'll be right back. Hey there, friends. Welcome back to the Games Done Quick Hotfix. I'm your host, Smooth Operative, and you are watching Time Capsule. Just a quick reminder before we get into Luigi's Mansion that Games Done Quick will be holding a special speedrun marathon live at PAX East from March 21st through 24th. And the game submissions are open from now through February 29th. So if you are interested in participating, uh, maybe you've got a speed run you've been dying to show off, use the command exclamation mark PAX in our Twitch chat for more information or go to paxeast.gamesdonequick.com to submit. Now then friends, I hope you have your warm beverages, your cozy blankets, because we are about to see the horror that lies within Luigi's Mansion. Please welcome our next runner, Reds MSR. Hello, I am Red. This is the Luigi's <laughs> Mansion speedrun. 
And well, welcome. Um, a lot of really cool tricks, a lot of really cool tech in this run. Uh, so yeah, that's me. I'm the runner. I'm also joined by my two commentators. Hi, I'm HD Lax. Hello, I'm Loot So Heavy, otherwise known in the community as Big Max. Welcome, yeah. welcome. So before the run even starts here, I do actually have to do a glitch uh, called Map Glitch. So basically what happens is if you talk to or go through any text at all, and you reset the game, and at the same time mash A and Y, it'll open the map as the game's resetting, and it'll make it so it just doesn't show up for the rest of the run. Yeah, the, so I just did it there. The uh, Every time you pick up a key, it'll try and show you where that door is uh, that you can use the key on, and so we turn that off. We know where the doors, we know where the keys go, so we want to save time. So it's really For handy. Sure. Y'all know where you're going. Yeah. Um, anyway, I will give a countdown, and then I will start my run. Absolutely. So, uh, three, two, one, and go. Good luck. Good, Good luck, luck Red. All right. Thank you. He's off. He's so, off. Yeah, so, probably the first big thing that we should talk about here is Red's going to be playing on the Hidden Mansion mode of the game. Um, if you've ever done a casual playthrough of this game, you'll know that you've had to play through the game on the normal mansion mode, and once you've completed your playthrough of normal mansion, you'll unlock the mode that Red's playing on now. Yeah, yeah so Go ahead. Hidden Mansion basically just doubles your vacuum strength, and that's about it in the Japanese version. It's a lot different on PAL, it like reorganizes everything, but on the version I'm playing right now, it's that that's gonna be the only difference. Yeah, and another minor variation between Japanese and English Hidden Mansion is you take double damage on the English version, whereas on Japanese, thankfully, you do not. There's also another time save. Uh, we'll get to it, the difference between the Japanese and English version in terms of tech speed uh, and in terms of exclusive shortcuts. We'll point them out later. Uh, but there is a reason that we run on the Japanese version. Not necessarily for the no double damage, but uh, definitely for the... Uh, the shortcuts. Yep. You're seeing the minimap glitch in full effect here. It just doesn't pop up. Normally, every time you grab a key, you'd see a minimap showing where that key goes. But as you saw, Red disabled it. It's gone. And that time save just adds up throughout the course of the run. Nothing too exciting here. He's going to do some minimal setups here. A double, a little bit of a wide turn here. It's... The thing is with this game is everything looks sort of like, oh, he turned and flashed the ghost, but there's subtle nuances um, that you have to do. Otherwise, you might not flash both to ghosts. So it it looks a little easier than it is, but it's actually really tricky to do some of these doubles. And that was quite a wide double. So that was a really good anti run. Yeah. And here he's collecting both of these gold ghosts separately. And the reason that we do that is the ghosts in this game spawn in waves. And the ghost that's inside of that left wardrobe actually does not affect the next wave spawning. It's actually initiated by the ghost on the right. So you suck up the ghost on the right and you have just enough time to catch the ghost on the left before the next wave spawns. Yeah, so coming up now, um, we've only found basic ghosts so far, but coming now are the portrait ghosts. And these ghosts, you have to do or wait for a specific thing to capture them. So each ghost is going to have a specific strategy that I do for each one. And you know, that's one thing that I think is very unique about this Luigi's Mansion iteration as compared to other LM games is just the portrait ghosts in this game just have such unique personalities and different strategies that you use to collect them. Yeah, there's there's a lot of lore. I mean, like when you play through the game the first time, you're not going to know how some of these interact or how you're supposed to um, get them to show their heart. And so you actually will use the Game Boy Horror, which we won't usually go into unless we're scanning something. Uh, but you'll scan the heart and it'll kind of tell you like a little hint. And so you're supposed to kind of figure it out. But it's it's really neat. That plus the mm -hmm. vacuuming is really unique to this Luigi's Mansion. So I had to wait for Neville to yawn. You didn't really see him yawn there because um, I got him so quickly, but for this one I just have to pull the curtain and Lydia gets sad about the draft and I suck her up. Well, I mean, 
I'd be sad too. I mean, somebody's you know doing my hair. Somebody just yeah. opens the window, cold air's coming <laughs> yeah. in. Like I'd be upset yeah, too. You, you get, you get the next thing you know, you're in a vacuum. You yeah, really like this. They this happened this too quick. It's not even real, and they decided to put a broken window there. Like that's their fault. Anyway, coming up, this is a trick called Laser Crusader. Uh, the cutscene trigger that would normally play here does not actually extend on the left side of this room, so you can skip it if you hug this left wall and are up far enough. It's about two seconds, right, of a, of a little cutscene that'll play. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we definitely don't want to do that, so shout out to Laser Crusader. Anyway, really upcoming. cool trick. It's a really difficult trick that I really mm -hmm. hope I get. But I might the not. dreaded. Oh, yeah, it's okay. The dreaded Chauncey one cycle. So funnily enough, Laser Crusader was found like a week before. Uh, this next trick that Red's gonna go for now, as he mentioned, Chauncey one cycle. Uh, up until recently, I want to say about a year ago, Chauncey was the only portrait ghost in the game that you could not one cycle, and it's by far the hardest one to do. So what he's gonna do here is he's gonna lock onto Chauncey. And then he's going to listen for a specific audio cue. And when that audio cue plays, he's going to release the R trigger and repress it in about one to two frames. And ideally, he will re-grab him. Well, let's we'll see if I get it. Good luck. You got this. Yeah, good luck. It is frame perfect. Ah, dang. I was a frame late. Yeah, so that just shows how tight of a trick that is to get. It's not easy by any means, but it saves it, 35 seconds when you do get it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it's... So so Chauncey's a brat. He is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah what what is. This is what makes the game, I wouldn't say, like, painful, but, like, it's a grind because this is area one. It's the most run area, and now you have this kind of wall um, for upper oh. echelon runners, and you kind of have to get good at Chauncey one right. cycle. I mean, it's... It's make or break. So most of the runners will just reset if they don't get it. Um, but there are ways to make it consistent. It, it is a, a very difficult trick, though. Shoutouts to uh, Glitch PhD uh, for helping find that. Our our Glitch doctor himself in the community. <laughs> yeah, shoutouts. I actually I meant to get hit by that rocking horse there, but I I was a little bit too far left. So I had to do a slower ball catch setup, but overall not bad considering I didn't get Chauncey one cycle. It's probably important to mention um, that it does actually lose time to put Chauncey below 50 HP if you do normally do two cycles. So I actually lost more time there than I would have normally because I went for it and didn't get it. Yeah, and the reason for that is normally Chauncey would just throw two sets of rocking horses at you, but when you get him below 50 HP, he'll actually throw a third one at you and that third one loses about three seconds. Eat, even though they're moving faster. Shout out to Pike and Glitch PhD for the five on that. Pike. Really cool, really cool strat. That's all right. Mountain yeah. RNG's coming up. Now the real run begins. Yep. <laughs> We're going to get into some. Mentions. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry. Uh. It's all good stuff. You're going to have sick RNG. <laughs> it's going to start with uh, early release, right? We're all going to have a great time. Not only that, he's going to get tech skip right after that. Oh, Butley sure. Mouse will show up. <laughs> Butley whole, Mouse. Everybody will be there. He might even get kitchen and tea. Oh, man. The money doesn't matter, though. Uh, the no out of bounds version of this game, you can't go out of bounds. You can't beat it in six minutes like any percent. Uh, but you don't need to get a high rank that you would in 100%, and you don't need any money that you would in other categories, and only 40 boosts. So there are... Uh, some pretty lenient requirements. You don't have to get everything, but you do have to get pretty much all the way through the game. You have to beat it and unlock all the necessary rooms. Yeah, so this category just requires you to do the bare minimum without nice. going out of bounds. Oh, that's a nice... That was a really nice double. That is not the way that we've been doing it. It's kind of a recent thing that they found. It saves about a second, and it's pretty easy to set up, they say, but it looks so cool. It, yeah, it's a really cool one. This is also going to be, uh, this is not recent now, but it's still, it's a few years old, but the Shy Guy six piece. Oh, yeah. The six piece is awesome. It saves Shout about a second Flau. compared to the doubles, but it just looks so cool when you do it. He's intentionally going to hit that. This is all intentional and kind of corral him, and then he's going to do what we call feathering the vacuum. 
and that allows him to not get the full uh, sucking power, pretty much, and then they'll come forward and he can then fully press the button, get the mass off in 6P, so nice yeah, job, well, Red. Thanks. Well, unfortunately, the world does not reward me for my efforts. That's all right, okay. baby. We just get the bad RNG out of the way now. Right. Now course. it's, yeah. yeah. So those guys, they can show their heart either 10 seconds early or 10 seconds late. Um, yeah. And I got the uh, bad RNG, unfortunately. Yeah, he did get the late cycle there. And unfortunately, there's nothing you can do to really remedy that. There's no setup for it. If you don't get early release, you just sort of have to eat that 10 second time loss. Um, something you might notice me doing is I'll pull out my uh, camera. To, uh, and before Ghost spawns, and that actually, Luigi's so distracted by the things on his Game Boy Aura that he doesn't even notice the ghosts are spawning, so he doesn't get scared. Yeah, normally, if he wasn't interacting with an object or looking through the Game Boy Horror, uh, the spawning of the ghosts would startle you for a second, and that's a time loss because you can't interact while you're startled. Uh, and so you do that. And then obviously another thing he did while he was at that corner of the wall and he started to run a little funny is there's a poster hiding a button there that he removed early uh, so that he doesn't have to do it now. And that saves quite a bit of time. Yeah, it's a few seconds to just kind of vacuum the... the va it's just kind of vacuum it through the wall because there's only a poster with a boo behind it. It's called Poster Skip. It's a kind of a controversial name because you're not actually skipping it. You're just pulling it off early. This is true. Yeah. Maybe it's more like, I don't know, poster defamation or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it's... That's a good way of putting just it. Just vandalizing <laughs> the mansion. Yeah, yeah. But you vandals. Wow. <laughs> now he's just released all the booze, which is actually not a good thing. But yeah, so we have welcome. to do it to progress the game. Yeah, so welcome yep. to... The things that have ruined my life the past five years. The booze. <laughs> <laughs> this is an average Luigi's Mansion runner's worst nightmare. If I get this, shout out to Jared's Giants, because this is this manipulation. Oh my. Oh man, shout outs to Jared. It's like I was saying, we're just getting the bad RNG out of the way now. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I mean, I got worst possible RNG with the text. But that's okay. Like, it's text still skip. text skip. It's still text skip. We take it. Mario. Bam. All right, HD, explain text skip, why that's so important, and how many times we're going to see it throughout this run. Yeah, so I believe we're going to see text skip. Ideally, we'll see it three times throughout the run. You're going to see him do it in Lydia's room when he goes back there, and as well as laundry room, but that one's a little difficult. And maybe, if we're lucky, kitchen. Breaker, too. He's he's a guru As well as breaker. Yeah, some yeah. more than I thought. Five but total times, ideally. Probably explain our pumping as well. well well, hang on. We gotta explain text. We, we gotta skip. explain text skip first. Text. Yeah, I'm why sorry, it works? I'm so focused so... in right now. <laughs> uh, it's hard to pay attention to both at one time. Okay, so text skip. How that works is basically you pull a cloth off of an object about halfway, and then you suck up the boo, and then you suck up the cloth. And when you suck up the cloth, that overrides the text that Egad would give you. So. It's particularly important for you to get it on that first boo because Egad sort of explains how you can save the game with the boos, and it's just a lot of dialogue there. So thankfully, he got it on that first boo. The vacuum register is like the last thing. So the last yeah. thing is the cloth. It doesn't think you have a boo, and we just continue on normally. It's yeah. awesome when it, when you can do it and set it up. It's awesome, yeah. especially in that room. And unfortunately, it doesn't work on things like gems and elements, but it does on cloths. Yeah, so something I'm doing on each boo is I'm doing a thing called R pumping, and I'm, oh, I'm pretty bad at explaining it, so I'll let, I'll let them do it. Oh, and this is for you, Big Max. Oh, okay. That means Ooh, he's going to intentionally knock. lose time by not vacuuming the toilet and knocking it, but oh, wow. we... We talk about this. I don't think anybody in their right mind runs into the restroom and opens the lid up by taking their vacuum out. And, <laughs> like, I don't think that's just not how you usually do it. I'm not going to lie, you know? So, thank you for knocking on the toilet. You're welcome. Vacuum robots, maybe they're getting a little advanced nowadays. <laughs> uh, 
but back to art pumping while he's doing this uh, uh, mirror room. Uh, pretty much the way it works is you're going to have the element of the vacuum pressed down L the entire time. And the R button is what controls the, the sucking. The L would be like blowing an element. And so when you have L pressed down and you every 10 HP, you would pump, release R and press R. You do what we call R pumping. And it's really important for boos uh, because you get a certain amount of cackles, 15 per boo which is 10 HP R pumps per. So 150 is the theoretical uh, amount of HP you can take off of a boo if you were R pumping them and keeping them in place. And then of course we can get into the more intricate details of R pumping, such as boo dragging, where you drag a boo further right. back to the opposite side of the room. That way you can deal more than 150 HP and you're gonna see him do that on breaker boo later in the game. But, is he um, a, is he a drag or a wall strat? Uh, wall strat, baby. Oh, oh yeah. wall strat. Oh, yeah. yeah, you'll wall you'll strat see for the win. You'll see the manipulation. Uh, the boos have a way that they leave the room. You can actually follow them out. So even after the fifteen cackles, we'll be seeing that as well. And it's that and the boo drag and the manipulation that allows you to create more space between the wall he's going to clip through and the room that you're in. And so you'll you'll see that later on in some of these higher HP boos. Um, but any type of normal boo under 150, he's just going to do 10, 10 HPR pumps, keep it in place. Which was huge when they found that out because the old days were like the wild, wild west. You just put your vacuum on the boo and just, that was it. There was no R pumping, it didn't exist. Yeah, and that was back in the old days of speed running. I actually oh, started yeah. running at the tail end of that. So I got to experience it just a little bit and then thankfully R pumping was found. Just made the game 10 times better. What kind of skip is he going to do here with the hat? He's like, you know, he's going to skip the chest spawning, right? Yes. Hopefully. Because that gives him time to open up the chest and then activate the mouse hole. Yeah, I also did something where I, I grabbed the fire medallion and at the same time I saved and then reset the game. So I skipped a bunch of text doing that. Yeah, not only that, that resets the cycle of the ghost that he's sucking up right now, the butler because usually he's walking back and forth down that hallway and when you reset and you go down the hallway to actually light his candles uh he's actually right at the beginning of the hallway there we and call it, it so butler happens cycle. to work out yes that's uh, how you know you got a good butler so now you're seeing him do the first japanese exclusive trick uh mouse hole tech skip and if you go through that mouse hole and you suck up a boot, it just skips the text, which is really nice. And we're gonna do that two times here. Did it once already, and nice quad. Nice. That's trickier than it looks because you're having to juggle the other three that are trying to hit you. And he intentionally got hit to give himself iframes because uh, Luigi blinks when he gets hit. He gives you guys, uh, give it, you get time so you can't get hit again. And he was using that to not get um, the bats to, to clear the bats. Mm -hmm. And we just saw two tech skips. Let's see if we can see a third one here. Oh, man, Michael, get ready to wake up. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. It was kind of weird because he's Michael's behind. still sleeping. He's still sleeping. Th this is a hard tech skip. He has to grab that cloth, uh, one of the cloths, usually the one on the left, before the boo is at zero HP, pretty much. And it's it's tight. But you can tech skip in there, laundry boo tech skip, and uh, it's a cool one. Yeah, um, I probably would have had that, but I had a really weird angle with the vacuum because it's, you can actually block the boo spawning if you stand in a really specific spot and it'll spawn early, and I wasn't really ready for that. It's water thing, by the way, HG, I'm calling it. Five frames of time I'm inclined to agree. Frame. Five, five frames. They told me there's frames. no time save, but there is. Five frames. It, it's five frames. I'm there's taking frame it. Counter. Now, unfortunately, I'm losing five frames. Oh, no. <laughs> well, then... <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You'll get him back. The boo will be in the perfect spot. He's gonna pick the right song. It, it. Funny enough, number two is never right. It's either one or three. Uh, so if you ever pick two, it, it couldn't have been right. <laughs> there was that wasn't it. <laughs> I've done it before, but it's not the answer. <laughs> Just gotta double check sometimes. It's some sometimes. Like, what, what if somehow the unused song plays and that's on the oh, second option? Oh no. 
that's not. Yeah, then the safari ghost is real too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That was a nice melody. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we're gonna come up to our first optional portrait ghost, Mr. Lugs. He's uh, sitting there. The description is he ate himself to death and he still wasn't full. That's deep. It, he's, <laughs> we, we don't know, we still don't know what it is. I mean, whether it's like rice or pudding or like- it, It's actually no fried rice. rice. That is a, that is a official thing. Okay. As in the 3DS commercial, it called it fried rice. Now we know. Now we know. They confirmed it for us after all this. It looked like rice. Do you know what I mean? It cleared away like rice when you when you suck it up when you have to mm -hmm. do 100. percent So that makes sense. Let's see if he gets kitchen uh, kitchen boot tech skip. Got the perfect lock. Setting up for it. Oh, Michael might have to get out of bed either way. Oh man, that could not have gone any more clean. Ooh, that man. was perfect. Yeah, he's awake now. Uh, I think Shout I'm... out to Michael T double zero because of that. <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. So he's gonna dodge the dog's attacks two times, and then he's intentionally gonna get hit hit on the third lunge here because that spawns Mr. Bones a frame early, or a cycle early rather. And it positions uh, the dog to be in a way that he can use. He can get the heart to show up before the bone actually hits the ground. Mm -hmm. T uh, Tass, Tass G boy. Oh yeah. Nice. Real runner here. Nice. He's going fast, boys. That's that's a really fun double. Uh, it's not. This one's not as hard as it looks. It's actually pretty easy. Uh, and it, it does save some 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 solid time. I'm gonna go for something here called the. Oh, I spot. I was I was hoping you were gonna do if this. You hold You're gonna C right, there's loop. like a slight chance he'll spawn right next to you. <laughs> he usually doesn't, but he might. Who knows? I thought his spawn was based on how early or how late you tap the C stick, and that dictates where he spawns. I have no so idea. So, like, if you wait too long to tap C stick, he'll spawn further We're away. We're about from to find you. out. Uh, I, I assume he's been holding it the right, whole like, time, really right? Late into the thing, so we'll find out if that's true right now. Uh oh, <laughs> 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 he did it wrong. <laughs> Getting kind of close. I, I like how I like how I could hear it before I could see the like just slightly before I could see where he spawned. <laughs> And, uh, if it was done correctly, he would have been directly to the left, <laughs> like in a very short distance to the left. Uh, oh, okay, okay. We, we actually have a practice thing that we play on sometimes that puts him in that spot. Um, and that's like the the fastest way. The, the task will do it that way. But not this time. I still think it was fun you went for it, right? Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I had that's, to. That's two seconds, if that. That was area two. That's pretty much how fast some of these bosses go. Uh, casually, Bogmire's probably a, a a tough boss. His pull is really, really strong. You have to have really precise um, pumps, uh, not the R pumps, but the actual C stick pumps. I guess we should probably explain that. That the way that you vacuum in this game is not like any of the other LMs. If you played it, where uh, you're doing some kind of uh, a mashing or charging it up, it's directional and so wherever the ghost is moving you need to pull in the opposite direction and it's uh, still 10 HP so every 10 HP you reset the, C uh, the control stick to neutral and then pump back uh, and so you have to do it rhythmically and Bogmire definitely has a strong pull so if you're off timing he'll drag you and then break okay, so now we're on the area 3 which in my personal opinion is the most difficult area I think so, especially yeah. for no out of bounds, right? Like I think this is kind of the the, the pace setting. I think usually good area threes carry into good area fours, um, but yeah, area I mean, this, three is this area in particular is just extremely RNG heavy. A lot like, of you have to spots. do a, you have to do a lot of backtracking in this area just to go after some booze that you're missing. 
Oh, man. I'm gonna go for what I call the best strat in the game and save uh, half here a we second. Go. Stumble skip. I'll I did stumble not skip. get it, unfortunately. <laughs> he did not get it. That is one of the dumbest strats in the game. We don't really know how it works, but you can skip Luigi stumbling at the bottom if you pull out water and get scared as you fall. And sometimes, if you're lucky, it might work. And you lose half a second if you miss it. And there's Mario. Oh, yeah, there's Mario. <laughs> Sometimes if you're oh, lucky, it might work. Yeah, yeah this see, is Luigi crazy. Looks they don't right now, but it, on the inside, he's like, "Yeah, finally." <laughs> they, they don't give you a whole lot of backstory. Granted, we've been spamming through it, but you get a mansion, you get here. There's ghosts in here, and your brother's missing. Exactly and so now you get to figure it out. It just gets thrown in there. Yeah, the, and I'm not joking. That's not like a TLDR. That's literally what it is. You show up. You're like, I yeah. want a mansion. Um, That's in crazy. The manual Where's of the game, my brother? It says that he won a mansion in a contest he never entered. So I just picture he got one of those like scam calls <laughs> that, that says he won a mansion. He fell for it. <laughs> oh dang. <laughs> So yeah, Mario's trap. Uh, and there's uh, there's a, a boo with a crown in front of him. That's all we know. Mario should have read the fine print, you know. Yeah, literally. How did they should have waited and went together, but that's yeah. that like horror movie trope where you got to go alone and then like, well, what uh -huh. happened? Well, you you guys went alone. <laughs> what do you mean? What happened? But it's okay. Luigi's here to save the day, and that's what's cool about it. So Red set just set up a tech skip there. Um, as he was flipping on that flip pad there, he grabbed the tablecloth and pulled it off yeah. about halfway. So now he's going to get the final medallion here, and then he's going to get the boo. Or he's going to get the boo first. Okay, he's going to get him I, second. I should have searched the bucket, but it's kind of hard to react to that. It's he's going to switch out of there now. Mm -hmm. Now watch. He's going to be in the left side, and I can't get the tech skip anymore. Just drag him. Yeah, oh, so no. something we should mention is that <laughs> Boo switches in this game are on a global timer, so they'll always switch at the same time, every time. It happens when you enter the mansion that it uh, mm -hmm. that the timer starts. I have to do it. You can get it. Hmm. Nice. You did it. Uh, and so the Boo technically had a chance because of the way that played out to switch, and if it would have switched to the left-hand side of the room, it would have got blocked on the chest that was open and wouldn't have went to the middle of the room. It would have made the tech skip very hard. So, I shot the Boo ball straight up. Do you want to mind explaining what that's for? Yeah, so you may have noticed in the tea room, like he was saying, he shot that Boo ball up, and the reason for that is this next portrait goes Nana. We have to hit her with three yarn balls. However... Did he set up for it? Yeah, yeah. So, by shooting the boo ball, we can actually fire these yarn balls in rapid succession. So if done right, you'll see it here. Oh man, this... We call it swag balls. Oh, okay. okay. Well, we got one of them. <laughs> Alright, yeah, it, it instantly uh, right. zooms. Uh, well, unfortunately, oh. I made a really weird mistake there. It's okay. Uh, right, if you, hit, all, if you oh. hit one of the balls, uh... Yarn balls anywhere other than Nana. Uh, right. She cackles and resets. And yeah, congrats to everyone watching. You saw my worst Nana ever. <laughs> Hold on. We, we don't know if it's going to be the the 46 cackle Nick Boo yet in the book, the bookshelf. So. <laughs> the Nick oh, dude, Boo. That was hilarious. <laughs> so let's, let's <laughs> not say it's the worst one just yet because you got to get this Boo. Oh, I might. I'm in quite the situation here. <laughs> oh no. Oh yeah, he's put himself in oh. a bad predicament. Yeah. So, um, in case you're wondering what happened there, I auto yeah, that's not supposed to happen. on the pearl, and I didn't have enough time to get the key when I wanted to. I'm also pretty sure he went that natural hall there. I think he did. Yeah, so for whatever reason, Luigi prioritizes random objects lying on the ground. He can lock onto things like gold bars, hearts, pearls, as you just saw there. And for some reason, he'll prioritize that over the boo. So now that boo is going to go to Ante Room, so he's going to have to go back to Area 1 to get him. We don't or know just that yet. I, yeah, I actually I have right a in. secret strat. I think if I leave Astral first, he might come back in. You think he'll still be in the hallway? No, I think he might walk, go into Astral if I just go and do Moonshot first. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, possibly. Never mind, he switched out. He's in the answer. I'm gonna have to grab him. 
Yeah, that is a, a really massive time loss, actually, but it's really not that big of a deal. Good old auto lock. Well, I mean, look, coins are important, bills are important, hearts are important. The ghosts, not so important, Luigi. Yeah. He's Even got his priority. To finish the game. He's got his priority <laughs> straight. I'm telling you, longevity, get a little money. Uh, this is like the most random thing too. Uh, we don't really have a good explanation for this other than they put a moon in the mansion, and they pretty much point you right at the fact you have to shoot these at it. And like, okay. uh, there's. There's casually, no rhyme or reason for this. I have a casually, theory. that can be deceptively difficult. Yeah, it, 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 that yes. angle is terrible. Like the depth perception on that is one of the worst in any game ever. I, I don't know how they messed it up so bad. It, you will think you are shooting it at the moon. You'll be nowhere near it. Yeah. <laughs> we have a little setup for it uh, that makes it pretty easy, but casually it is a nightmare. But occasionally uh, you will still see top runners miss it. Oh yeah, multiple times in a row. Yeah, so, Man, we have to collect these items. Yeah, we, we give them the clairvoyant. So I actually have to do Billiards Mirror Warp. I have a theory for the moon, by the way. You know how in Sonic Adventure 2, Eggman like blows up the, the moon? Mm -hmm. Pretty sure Luigi is just Eggman. It, it's like and, a crossover but theory? But he's like Luigi Man. Yeah, Luigi <laughs> Man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they got—they both got pretty awesome mustaches. I—I I think the fact that we were all casually glancing over the fact that he said he has to do billiards mirror warp, and I was right before the run. <laughs> like, no, like, yeah, you called like, it. Like, like, you know, it's so crazy. As I said, Red, you just got to go in here and do billiards mirror warp because nobody is going to want to see it. And you know what? He listened. And and he somehow yeah. made it happen. That makes me think that that choke on that move was intentional. He was oh, doing yeah. this on purpose. Well, don't don't, oh, don't man. bring out my secret plan here. <laughs> Not the secret <laughs> plan. Not Z. the secret plan. Plan Z was coming plan out. Z. What we're what we're getting all worked up about is there is a faster way of uh, collecting this item in this room and the boo at the same time, pretty much, and getting what we call funny text, doing this whole save warp thing. But if he save warps, he'll reset the boo back in Anana's room at 100 HP, and you don't necessarily want to go find that boo. Uh, again, back in Anna's room. So, yeah. the and routing wise. Kind of the whole gag with this save warp here is doing billiards mirror warp instead of doing the save warp is like a very bad sin. That's just yeah, kind of like the joke that we've <laughs> come up with. Yeah, for that. It's like time. a faux pas. It's and a Luigi. Uh, you just don't do it. And here like, it is. Don't do it. There's a. Someone put once, like, pro tip, there's a mirror in Safari Room, you should use it. And then Pablo responded with, there's a pro tip, there's a mirror in, in, in the uh, billiards room, do not use it. Alright, let's see what this boo is. Oh, yeah. The good news is, you did not have to get fire again. Yeah, I, I'm not going to have to. I probably will yeah. anyway, because likely I'm going to run out. There he is. So not a massive time loss, but still kind of annoying. Huh. That's an odd number of boos. What happens at 15 HD? Oh, no. <laughs> well, the worst thing ever happens after <laughs> collects good. 15 boos. And that's when EGADS, the length of the text that he can give you after collecting a boo is completely random. And it can vary from about a half a second long to about five to six seconds, just depending on how fast you mash. Yeah. It happens right after 15. And you can start getting the dreaded what we call Van Gore text, which is Egad tries to warn you about a person, a ghost that's creating all the ghosts, painting them. And uh, he can tell you that multiple times. Yeah, in he can a row. tell you that multiple times as if you're going to forget. But we never forget because that long text, it adds up, man. Oh, it adds up. That's yeah. kind of why we talked about Area 3 being that pace setting. It, it, there, it, the boo text, especially in this, you're going back to back to back boos. It can add up if you just keep getting the long text. Uh, right now he's doing twins, and uh, they they play you know, hide and seek. Here. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be a twins double. This is a good setup for a double here. Usually we take the uh, car guy out and then drop plane dude, but 
it's a little harder to take the plane, you know, off first than the car, and that's what we call the double. Yeah, you need so to set it up that way, though. That was a really good twist. Yeah, um, it was. Don't mind the fact that Boo left. That doesn't actually lose like any time. <laughs> it's just yeah. kind of, it's just kind of weird. What? Something interesting to note is you actually can't collect boos in dark rooms. However, you can in lit hallways. So. If a boo escapes into a dark hallway, you're gonna have to lead him back into a lit room so you can catch him. But thankfully, this is already lit up, so really, it, it doesn't save any times or lose any time. To... Yeah. So something that's interesting is that um, the boo radar. I'm using that to kind of know where the um, where the boos are as I enter these rooms, and that the the boo radar actually changes um, if you get that boo in that hallway because the direction that Luigi's facing is stored as you enter a door. So it will be slightly different because normally you'd be running straight left, so it would flash red for the painting, but it's gonna flash yellow for the painting instead because I'm facing away from it as I enter. It was gonna set up for another tech skip here. This one is probably the freest one that you can go for, so this should be guaranteed no matter what. I'll say not, <laughs> not best spawn ever though. That I been just good have that much confidence in you. Thank oh, you, yeah, this is easy tech skip, and then boom, nice. Nice work. Thank you. Now we're coming to uh, pretty much the intermission, like the slide intermission that everybody yeah. else has if they want to go run and like, use the restroom, get a drink of water. Uh, yeah. He's going to mash through text for the next minute and a half. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be a good time for him. It no, hurts his fingers are going to hurt. It hurts yeah. the wrist. Yeah, every... No. I still... What kind of controller are you using for this, Red? I'm using a GameCube controller, just a standard GameCube. one. Okay, yeah, the standard for this. The one I used to play this game for the first time, actually, as a matter of fact. Oh, wow. Oh, it's, a, it's a relic. The re yeah. yeah, bringing to up the fair, relic. I Frankensteined it together to make it usable, but it is the one I used. Oh, we're going to have to get a picture after the show. <laughs> well, uh, well, it looks normal. It's just that, like, um, since I was born after this game, I was handed down this game as a kid. Oh, my gosh. So... <laughs> um, the controller I got was terrible. It had the rubber chewed off. Oh no. And it also the Y button was always sticky. So when when my old <laughs> controller broke, I had this one and I had to take it apart and like clean the entire thing and it took forever. But it is it is a decent controller now. Props for even taking it apart and putting it back together and getting it to yeah. work again. And, so yeah, and bravo. that's me doing it, by the way. And I know <laughs> nothing about any of that. And I was Perfect. getting pretty frustrated doing that. <laughs> I'm glad you still have that relic with you. Uh, yeah. So pretty much all the Mario items we collected, uh, we didn't necessarily point them out, but there's five of them. There was the boot, the, the star, the hat, the glove and the letter, I think, are all of those, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the conclusion of giving her all the items, she volunteers to have Luigi suck her up into the vacuum. So she offers no resistance throughout the suck up, which can kind of make the suck up a little weird. So you kind of have to spin the control stick and the C stick simultaneously to uh, get the optimal suck up there, which is something that you wouldn't do on any other portrait ghost. Yeah, again, part of that whole uniqueness, every portrait ghost pulls different, um, kind of has a different lore to it. It's it's really, really cool. Uh, it's one of the things that I really like about this game. And there's, what, 23 of them? Yep. So Red's now going upstairs for the first time. Uh, we'll be on the second floor. Y yep, yeah, the... the <laughs> the not implemented into the game Safari Ghost. Wasn't I think you've been playing your way. beta copy. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. If you know anything about this game, that ghost is not real. It was a prank in Nintendo Power. <laughs> it's a really funny one because it fooled so many people, but it was it was a prank. So it was just not supposed to be there in the first place. Yeah, it's not there. The the only unused um, portrait ghosts that I can think of would be the chef. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we um, have. There's also we have early images. One called ELH, but I'm not sure what that's like actually supposed to be. Yeah, people have speculated that was an early concept design for Bogmire, but that's never been disputed. We like to go deep into the Luigi's Mansion lore. We want to know. The, we, we want to know oh. the games in and out. 
We got like, my, our first Vanguard text to the run. Oh man! So, <laughs> so yes, yes, there it is. The longest possible text that you can get from Egan. Oof. And unfortunately, he's already gotten, I want to say, three long texts. Yeah, there's some he's collected 15 yeah, yeah. moves. That one's significantly longer than the rest of them, though, just for the record. Like, I only lose, like, a couple of seconds per medium text, but that one loses, like, like five or six. That one's the one that you really don't want to get in a row. This is uh, probably every casual player's worst Nightmare. <laughs> and nightmare. Yeah, this is... If you ever get down to the one boo left scenario, it's even unfun for top level runners. There's manipulations and stuff, but sometimes they don't cooperate. Uh, we always do it in one cycle or bust. I uh, definitely don't want to be two cycling this in a speed run, but uh, a hard boss to do casually. And for Red's sure. going to make quick work of it. Probably 14, 15 shot. Easy. There's 15 total boos. That's why uh, the, the number 14, 15. 15 yeah, so shots, very rare. If you ever plan on playing this game casually again, take notes because this is definitely a speedrun strat it, worth boss, using for casual play. This boss is actually just bad. <laughs> it's yeah, just... it's it's a rough design for for a casual um, playthrough. We all we've all been there. Uh oh, that's not good. It's no, still it's salvageable though. Don't don't uh -oh. Uh oh no don't worry. <laughs> no, not the shots. Oh man, he barely saved it. You oh, can see that Bulasis was reforming there, so he <laughs> barely got that one cycle. Super so nice. We still got to see the little one boo left scenario. He uh, did manipulate it by taking the vacuum uh, back on his back or out back again and trying to bait the boo to charge. You'll uh, The boo will make a little cackle noise and like bounce and then it'll charge. That's when you need to sidestep and spray ice. But trying to piece that together on a casual playthrough is... is it's tough. It's really tough. But nice Bulasis. And now we're on to Area 4, which is the hardest area, technically. Yeah, technically. There's, like, the thing about Area 4 is it's actually really not that bad, besides, like, two specific trips. I mean, we'll get into those. Yeah, yeah I mean, the Boo RNG at this point is pretty much a non-factor, because yeah. you only have to collect four of them. Yeah, you only so, need 40 to get to the end of the yeah, game. Yeah, so you yep. actually, it, it's it's 40 technically, but you get 15 of them from Bulasis. So, mm -hmm. that, like, You'll see that, yeah, the reds jump from 20 to 35. 36. Or 36, sorry, Safari. Come on, Big Max, I thought you ran this game. Come on, 100%. I'd be Ooh. at a whole different boo count here. <laughs> and you That's know true. that. I would be at 24, I'd be at 39, okay? So that's why it makes difference. <laughs> I, I was just yeah. looking for a reason to take a shot. I'm sorry. I, I know. I'm I'm a 100% exclusive runner. I've actually, funny enough, not logged a single run of no out of bounds. I, it is the truest speed category. If that tells you anything, I don't necessarily like going that fast. <laughs> I want to go just a little slower. Just a brisk walk is, is just all you need. Yeah, a brisk walk right. with some money. You're a lot of that because, like, half of Area Four is just walking up and down this mansion. You just have to keep going oh, yeah. the basement and the attic. And and blackout is coming too when the power goes, which is great. We get to meet everybody's favorite uh, birthday ghost. It's his birthday yep. pretty much every time we get there. Uncle Grimly, uh, we try and cheer him up. Uh, that's everybody's favorite RNG rotunda. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have a compilation of people just standing there waiting for him. Yeah, uh, so, we'll get to that. It's it's so good. Yeah. So the thing, the gimmick with Grimly is he's kind of like the Warlindas in the sense that he doesn't show his heart on a fixed time, but Grimly can show his heart from the moment you walk in the room, and the longest Grimly recorded is about fifty seconds. I want to say. Maybe Red would know better <laughs> the exact wait, time. Uh, wait, say that again. But what the longest what's the, grimly? What's recorded? the longest grimly? Um, it's either forty-eight or fifty. Okay, well, we'll just settle on. Well, we'll round rounded up to fifty. But that's yeah. a good range. So but anywhere from instant to fifty, and we're not joking. You will a, stand there in front of them. That is a yeah. very rare. It's situation. it's rare. Oh yeah. Um, Twenty seconds is pretty uncommon. Like the average grimly is going to be about four seconds, I'd say. Yeah, but, but it does happen. So. The gimmick that we have is in uh -huh. order to get Grimly to show us hard early, you have to compliment him. You, you, you say yeah, some nice I, things I about him. I say nice pants. We say you're looking great today, Uncle Grimly. <laughs> Happy birthday. Hope you're having... And more enough. Usually works out. Mario. Oh, a Pythagoras skip, right? I don't know yeah. how to explain this. Somebody's going to have to explain the right angle. There's no the explaining. It's just done. Okay. 
Yeah. It's just done. Do yeah, it. just there it is. So. He pythagged. He did a right so, angle. Grimly Anyways, got some Grimly. nice pants there. Nice shoes, Grimly. Happy birthday, Grimly. <laughs> there we go. See, it works every time. Not bad. Not bad. But you'll have runs where I'm not joking. People are just sitting there kind of like smiling. You almost have to laugh about it because that's there's nothing you can do. You cannot do anything other than wait for him to show his heart. But Grimly was kind. We like it. And we have to do this, Ghost, because he's holding the key to turn the power back on, and you do not want to be playing this game. Yeah, um, so, funny trivia about Grimly before I do break boot here. Um, the hint is that he, he's in a room that that he likes mirrors. So, yeah, you can take that as you will. It's weird, though, because they say that he, he's in a room that's dark that, he, that likes mirrors, there's mirrors, but why wouldn't he be in mirror room then? You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. We, there, there is no real correlation for why they give you that hint, and then he's in the room that he's in. We, we just know he's in that room, but casually, like you, you'd be running around the house looking for him. Okay. Well, I'm gonna need a little bit of focus for this. Okay. You can explain nice how job. that works. Yeah, so earlier in the run, I mentioned boo dragging, kind of going hand in hand with our pumping. Um, so to touch a little bit more on that, you can actually drag the boo, as you saw Red do there. Um, and you can prolong your R pump. So rather than doing it every 10 HP, you can do it every 11 or 12. So you just gradually gain more HP off the boo. And then in turn, you could probably get an extra pump out of him. So that just allows us to one cycle that 200 HP boo. Yeah, and that uh, without a charge either. Yeah, which From is the super middle of impressive. The Trust me, that's yeah. a lot harder than it looks. Way harder. Probably, like, I mean, you rank it, obviously, Chauncey one cycle getting consistent, then King boo, and then it's Breaker boo one cycle in terms of, like, your top three check marks of that upper echelon. Like, you got to be able to one cycle Breaker boo, and it is a hard yeah. trick to do. Big shout out. There are two ways to do it. I did the uh, wall strat, which is slightly slower, but it's a little bit easier. Shout out to my wall strat gang. You know, HD's in here right now. He also rise does up. Wall strat. Wall, wall strat. Yeah. There's there's a split uh, between the drag and the wall strat. I think the drag looks really neat, but I can understand. There's a lot of movement, a lot more, um, a lot more room to for error. But it looks so cool because you can literally manipulate the boo across the entire room. Any wall stratters in the chat? Yeah, if there's any, I, I have this. <laughs> oh, have there's the definitely wall stratters. You you know you know that there's so many LM runners watching it, and they're all they're all like, I'm a wall strat, I'm a wall strat. <laughs> yeah, I don't do breaker boot one cycle, so I, yeah. I don't fall into either one. There is so. um, an alternate strat where you don't do breaker boot at all, and you just do Vanguard boot, which is the standard route. But people who are at like 56 and above usually grab breaker boot. We should. What, what is the world record in this category? So we have a, a, a 54 20. So and what is that your is, PB red? Uh, 55 45. So I'm a little so bit, just about yeah. a little bit of ways it, away. It, just One day, but your sum of best is a is we already talked about this is a low 54. My you're a 53 runner. Even world record. <laughs> you're you're a 53 runner in my heart. Don't worry about it, bud. Uh, the, the clockwork gimmick here isn't too unobvious. It's just the uh, the little windies. That was kind of scary. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if that was us or you. Um. Um. I but... think I think we're good now. Yeah, we might have had a small hiccup in the broadcast, but uh, sit tight, friends. We're working on it. Okay. Oh. Did you get Toy Soldier Double at least? I did. Dang, and they don't even get to see it. <laughs> Where'd the other one go? Uh oh. <laughs> Alright, so. These guys are the bane of my existence now. 
That, no, that now, right? Just I'm gonna right, have to now. right now. I'm talking to, that, <laughs> to those to get us later. I've, yeah, I hope that you can iron it out with them. Because, you know. I didn't get Caleb Skid. Mm. Hey, that, that's the name of that specific one that's named after a runner who's passed now. Rest in peace, Caleb. Ah, uh, yeah, R.I.P. Rest in peace, Mr. Caleb. Yeah, but it's named after well, We always go for it. Yeah, we always go for it, and we always have to pop off when we get it, because that's what he would do. Uh, it's it's one of the best stumble skips. Nobody wants to stumble down that ladder. It, it looks really cool, because you, you kind of, like, get to keep stepping all in one motion, a little swivel. It's great. Uh, and he always was super excited when he got it. And so it's... It's a cool trick. Is this five piece? I have oh, he's going for it. Oh, yeah, well... I kind of botched it, but yeah, maybe... I, I'm okay. That's actually really... That's probably still faster than the, the triple by a yeah, little bit. I mean, honest. it was a really good recovery, though. Yeah, it was so a good recovery. Around. I'm actually kind of impressed with myself. I'm going to have to look back at that later. <laughs> that the, uh... The chances of those could have despawned were were um, were pretty high. I mean, after you shook the ghost off, so that was great. Let's go. He got perfect RNG here. And that typically doesn't happen in this room. It's very rare that you'll see that boo right there in that armor statue right next to the chest, but it's so fast when he is. It, you get to bait the charge instantly. This boo has a, uh, a high chance of charging, really high chance, if not guaranteed, it's although guaranteed. I don't want to say that. Yeah, it's guaranteed. Well, okay. That I'm standing it's, too it's far actually, away from. It. That's what I was gonna say. It's just certain booze as can and or can't. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. And that armory room that he was just in, it's by far the laggiest room in the game. So you have a high risk of dropping inputs when going for that boost suck up, and he already has 150 HP as is. So so your cackles already have to be perfect. So yeah, there's just a lot that can go wrong there. You do them by that same feel of like a normal room at 10 HP, and you might be a little too fast, and so it you have to kind of really monitor the uh, the pumps. But he did a great job, and uh, Army Boo is definitely one of the uh, the other trickier boos, and I'd say it's Weston Boo. Yeah, in, I, the, in the no out of bounds category. I'd say the best way to remedy that Armory Boo situation and reduce the possibility of dropping an input is to just release R and repress it all the way. Yeah, take that extra time. Mm -hmm. It's worth it. Now he, uh, you'll note he won't clear the room. Just gonna get the chest with the key. Um, there's no reason to. Um, Red's a professional. Uh, Some people would clear this room. Some people who specifically run only a hundred percent might. Well, I was like gonna Mr. say Big unless Max you're here. unless you're worried that you're gonna lose Weston Boo up top. That's what I was getting at. Oh no, yeah, you, yeah. yeah. But as I said, you're a professional. No. But yeah, now Red's coming up to what I believe to be the hardest portrait ghost in the game, excluding area bosses, of course, Weston. And the reason is, is because of these ice physics and the icicles that can potentially hit you. Uh, that was they just, really good, though. Wow, he got, that yeah, he got him really in the campsite. Up. But sometimes it can go wrong, but Red just made easy work of it. The floor makes it really slippery. We already talked about how you have to pull in the opposite direction. And so since you're fighting for control pretty much with the ghost, the floor isn't helping you. Uh, and so you'll see top runners every once in a while still drop Weston. It's uh, it's the floor. Yeah, and this boo is double cackling for red, so I don't believe that this is going to be a one cycle here. Yeah, that was unfortunate. I, it's okay. I it pushed up. him up as he spawned, so it was a really awkward uh, thing. Not that much time lost, though. No, it went out right back in. But again, the floor plus the fact that the the double cackle, and that can be due to a couple of things, the angle of the vacuum, how close you are to the boo, how far away you are. Um, and so the floor is slippery. You're trying to get your footing. You're trying to grab the boo. It's a recipe for disaster. And that's mm -hmm. what makes that boo challenging. But now he's got all 40. So yeah, no he's more got boos. all 40. No more boos. That's so now like, he's... He's, he's on his way up to Van Gore now, the person who is responsible for creating all the normal ghosts that we see in the mansion. Yeah. Pablo and if you kind of want to, if you kind of want to take a deep dive into the iceberg of this game, some people have theorized that Van Gore also created the portrait ghosts in this game because uh -huh. he was lonely and just wanted his own family. But 
Well, you, yeah, you get to see sort of, and you'll, well, we didn't get to see uh, Biff really close up, but you'll see some of the busts in the uh, the artist studio look there, like some of the portrait are ghosts. There are sculptures of, yeah, yeah, yeah there are can sculptures. You, can you imagine that? You just walk in, Luigi's like, hey, just letting you know, like everyone you created, they're all dead now. Well, Even though not, they were dead before, they're going back to, going before, back to a painting. But like you know, say. Luigi, he somehow is stupid enough to fall for a scam and a contest oh. he never entered. But he also is smart enough to kill the dead. So you can take that as as you will. See, there's Lydia's bus right there. Mm -hmm. And if you look to behind the, the paintings of the ghost, you'll also see Biff Atlas, who was an optional ghost, so we didn't capture him. Yeah, that so was when we ran on the treadmill, him. and this he was is, lifted weights. It's just a gauntlet of like most of the uh, the ghosts. It, it is a pretty easy fight. But, it's all well. Yeah. It's all the ghosts. I mean, most well, except it, it for is, it's most because there's a couple that aren't here, but. Yeah, it's a, they, it's a relative. I know who problem. I know you're talking about that bowler ghost that always scares you on you know the telephone room side of it. Yeah, no. There, there's no bowler ghosts. Nice, that was really really yeah, fast triple there. Some go for instas there, but it's a little risky. That was yeah. still that's all I like to do. Get that yeah. swipe across. Some of the hitboxes on these ghosts, particularly the grabber ghosts, are kind of really large, so it's not uncommon to just stun one or two of them there and completely miss the third and not and wonder how you missed it. It's really weird. It's faster to fire these and they drop bombs, so yes. it just keeps the bombs from it's going out. Actually a little bit slower, but it's not consistent to set them up. Oh, well. Yes, well, then, burn there you go. So that's that's why it's faster because of the consistency. All right, so I can get a fifty-seven still, but I have to let's go. The elusive strat. You know, and what he's referring to is King Boo One Cycle. Yeah. Oof. Found by it's yours tough. truly. Yes, Mr. Red's MSR. Red, do you want to explain how you found King Boo One Cycle? Okay, so Ooh, yeah, <laughs> this is a really dumb story. Um. I was doing runs one night and they weren't going well, so I just started practicing King Boo. And then there's a dark moon runner who goes by the name Gloomy Vicious, and he said, and I quote, "Red, if you once, if you three cycle King Boo with your feet, I will send you a picture of my right nostril." So I put my controller on the floor, and since I was doing so poorly, I shot this another ball at Bowser's head, and it took extra time for for him to come back. And the moment I noticed that, I started just popping off entirely. I'm like, guys, I found King Boo one cycle. You don't understand what just happened. But what I didn't realize is that my mic was actually broken. Um, it broke in the middle of it. So I just sounded like Alvin the Chipmunk while, oh I, while I was doing it. <laughs> also, I'm going to do something that loses time here, but it's ultimate sweat. Does it oh. lose time, though, if it... Oh, well, now now it's a time loss. I was going to say, if you got it, there's no time loss, but... Well, if, if I get it, I still have to wait for it to drop and stuff. That that If you get that, it's a really cool thing, because it, like, King Boo, like, will turn, and the, the crown will turn in the opposite direction, and there's a bunch of shining lights coming out of Mario's painting and stuff. But I didn't get it, yeah, and, so you don't get And then you'll just cool see stuff. that... You'll also just see that gem ram into the painting, and it just <laughs> yeah. won't go through. <laughs> Luigi will go through, but the gem won't. <laughs> it's fun. It's a good, funny uh, little, little cutscene. Uh, well, yeah, I guess this is the grand reveal because uh, we never really said what Clairvoy has said. I mean, there's a lot of things being said, Mario trapped, but, like, one of the key phrases was, <laughs> was Bowser, like, was mentioned. Just outright mentioned. <laughs> and that's the first you ever hear. So you go around the game, you're like, where's Mario? Oh, he's in a painting. Uh, Bowser. That's it, and then you get here. That's literally <laughs> that's the linear fashion. There, there's no like grand reveal. There's no leading up. There's no uncovering. It's Bowser. It just slams you in. It's like that. There he is. This is by far the most involved strat in the game, by the way. Absolutely. Like th this is like, and it's also kind of luck based at the same time, and it's at the very end of the run. So oh, Pablo's for... turning his sleep right now for luck yeah, based. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm gonna get it though, so it's okay. Yeah. Let's just, uh... And we'll stay quiet so you can focus. Ah, damn. Yeah, so unfortunately, King, so King Boo has um, a hitbox as well, as lo like along with um, Bowser's head, so King Boo can actually block the shot, that's where the RNG part comes in. The fact that you still got it to 282 off of that was <laughs> just So I'm just going to awesome. do a quick backup two seconds. 
So yeah, essentially what happens is the King Boo cycle starts when... Aw, uh, man. So yeah, as I was saying, the King Boo cycle starts when you knock Bowser's head off with a spike ball. So what he was trying to do there was hit Bowser with another spike ball, essentially restarting the cycle. So you have just enough time to get him in one cycle that way. Having a Joven King Boo right now. Just Shout out to Joven. Joven for those King Boos. Yeah, time, time. Sorry, time. Nice, <laughs> GG. GG's, man. GG's red. That was Thank awesome. You. Yes, gosh. I I was holding my breath because I saw you backing away from the boo, and I was thinking, there's no way this, there's no way he doesn't do it right. <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> How are you feeling about the that run, Red? What do you think? You know, actually, considering the things I did, that wasn't as bad as I thought I'd do. Yeah, you pulled it together in some of these situations. I, I was really excited to see what uh, has changed since uh, we had it on the show last time with, with HD Lax. Like, gosh, that was way back in 2020. <laughs> yeah, the fact that 2020 was four years ago is kind of I know. painful. It's wild. Well, Red, thank you so much for running the game. Do you have any, you know, comments, shout outs, anything um, you want to say? Well, obviously, if you ever if you ever want to run this game, there's a there's a Discord and a community and everything. Uh, I'm also really helpful personally to people. Just as my own charitable thing and <laughs> not to to my own bubble here. Obviously, shout out to the uh the commentators, Big Max and HD for coming on and doing this with me. Um Of course, was, man. You know. Always pleasure. Would not have been able yeah. to do this by myself. I didn't talk very much, so it would have been a pretty boring run otherwise. <laughs> um, <laughs> shout outs to the Luigi's Mansion community. If I could give any specific shout outs, I'd like to give it to um, HD Wax, Joven, um, Big Max. Um, off the top of my head, sorry, I'm trying to think. I should have wrote this down. HD, Big Max, Joven, Glitch Doctor, um, Pike as well, because he helped with the uh, in, with the Chauncey one cycle. And just any like general friends I've made since I've started speedrunning this game, you guys have changed my life for the better, and I'm glad that this all happened. And yeah, um, now we get to see Mario get changed back. Yeah. And um, I don't know if we'd have time to actually run the credits, but if we don't, I would like to show off a kind of cool thing you can do in the file select screen. Yeah, we can, okay. sure, go for it, yeah. All right, wait, are you saying go for it for the credits or the... Oh, um, yeah, the credits are fine. Okay, yeah. And there's some, it's only going to take, like, probably 30 seconds for me to do after the credits, if that's fine. Because, um, it's a, it's a game crash. You can crash the game three seconds in. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's, uh, let's see what you can do, Red, with this. Yeah, um, I don't know, how long are the credits? Like, That's what I was about to ask you, because I'm not joking. I was about to say, the credits might be slightly long. Yeah. Um, so I, I would know, show like, I would show Mario getting for for the sake of like I'm all for it, right? I'll, I'll but show for the Mario, sake of you know, Luigi Mario Batman. comes there, yeah, which is heartfelt. You gotta have it. It's what makes the whole game worth playing. I'm telling <laughs> you, this this is the end. You're playing your category. You get your PB. You you always let this run, and oh, then yeah. like. It's just perfect. Everybody's very, happy. You're happy. You're just a heartwarming happy. moment between two brothers. Oh yeah, yeah. Just, it just makes the speed run worth playing. I mean, so. it's it's like <laughs> the story gets really wrapped up here. I love it. Yeah, Luigi's gone through a lot of uh, a lot of torture through the uh, 58 minutes that I've been playing this game. <laughs> yeah. Oh <my> <laughs> There's a lot he's of like 58 crying, minutes. Laughing. Yeah, he's, he's, oh, he's, he's so yeah, he's so like, happy. It's, <laughs> hey. Uh, and then, then, then now I would take him to the file select screen. Yeah. So um, this is a cool little glitch you can do. This is only <laughs> the Japanese version, but you can crash the game. Uh, let me copy my file over so I have 31 instead of 30. You can actually crash the game three seconds in <laughs> to playing. You don't even have to go into EGAD's lab. All you have to do is press right A on the same branch. <laughs> And there you go. There you That's go. it. Game, Game crashes. Done. Game's oh, over. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's over. <laughs> so if you accidentally do that, and you don't know what happened, that's that's what yeah, happened. That's probably what happened. It's well, yeah. it's some weird programmed-in thing where they're just like, that's it. No game now. 
Well, thank you for the PSA because I think the gamers need to know. You know. Oh yeah, of course. Maybe they'll accidentally <laughs> crash the game or something. If you play this game on the Japanese version, avoid pressing right and A on the same frame. I think you can do it left and A too if you're on the second file specifically. Still. <laughs> No. Still, you gotta you gotta watch that. Yeah. All right, Red. Well, again, thank you so much uh, for being on the show and uh, loots HD Lux. I had a great time. It was nice catching up with the Luigi's Mansion run and uh, seeing what uh, has changed. So, thank you again so much, everyone, for being Absolutely. here. Absolutely, thank you, thank you so much for having thank us. You. Thank you for hosting this. Of course, thank you. All right, well, uh, my friends, we are about to roll to a break, but you better come back after that break because Yu-Gi-Oh! The Duelists of the Roses is next, and it's your move. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Game Stone Quake Hot Fix. I am your host, Smooth Operative, and you are watching Time Capsule. The stage is set and it is time to duel. So here to show us a run of Yu-Gi-Oh! The Duelist of the Roses, please welcome our runner, Clovis. Hi, Clovis. Hello, hi. This is real, right? We're live, everything is good. We're, Everything's we're live, good. it's real. This is it, <laughs> I can't believe it. This is actually, this is historical. This is actually the first appearance of Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist of the Roses on GDQ period, I'm pretty sure, as far as I'm aware. Let's, so hello everyone. Let's go. Hello. I hope we're all doing well. Uh, we have a lot of RNG in this run, so I don't even know what I'm going to be doing each duel exactly until I open, like I go into the duel and I open my hand. So I need to explain things like as I'm doing them, and of course contextualize everything beforehand. So the yes. timer doesn't actually start until I select the first side, so we're going to go to new game, but the timer will not start yet. So uh, let's do it. Let's go into new game. Yeah. And we'll get a... I'm ready. Yeah, it, it's there's a lot going on. So um, this isn't canon in Yu-Gi-Oh at all. So quickly, I'll explain the game itself. This was released originally Japan only, exclusive in two thousand and one, but then it was translated and released worldwide in two thousand three. So this was originally named Yu-Gi-Oh Shindu Monsters Two, which the original Shindu Monsters is Forbidden Memories. If you guys are familiar with that game, so. Uh, yeah, this is actually technically the sequel to that game, even though it plays more like a spiritual successor. Um, and it's kind of like the same game, except it takes place on a 7x7 seven seven grid, uh, which we'll see. Uh, people call it chess. It's not really like chess, but it's just like a title-based strategy game that features Yu-Gi-Oh cards as like summons or assets, effectively. Um, so we get summoned at the Stonehenge. Uh, the player character like you, whoever's playing this game, is like who they summon. And now we have to enter our name, and this actually is very important because we need one of the 17 existing starter decks in the game. So when we enter our name, it'll... ...in existing starter decks in the game. So when we enter our name, it'll tally up what characters we've entered, and then give us one set of three... ...of those existing 17 starter decks in the game. And conveniently enough, the deck we want, if we just enter in the capital A, uh, we will get the Patrician of Dark...
All right, everybody, apologies for the technical difficulties, uh, but we are back and Clovis is here to continue uh, explanations. So welcome back, Clovis. <laughs> Hello. Yes. So Australian internet is amazing. It's very, very high quality. Uh, so <laughs> anyways, uh, so what I was explaining is the starter deck. So there's 17 starter decks in the game and we get a choice of three of those depending on what name we enter. And we want the Patrician of Darkness starter deck specifically. So any name we enter that gives us that as an option is fine. So we can enter capital A as our name and we're fine. So now he's going to give us a selection of the three decks and we, every single speedrunner will use the Patrician of Darkness starter deck. And there's two main reasons for this. So the first one is it has a card called Dimension Hole. This will teleport our deck leader, which is like our avatar where we play cards from. Uh, it will teleport our leader, and if we play that across two turns by moving our leader, moving the card, and then activating and then moving again, we can close the gap and just jump across the entire field. So for like most duels in the game, that's like the best card to open with. Uh, the other thing that's really good for is it's the zombie deck, which zombies are strong on two fields in this game, which are the Yami and Wasteland tiles. And these two tiles exist in meaningful positions in like half of the duels. So uh, between those two things, most of the duels, uh, this deck is just way better at pretty much every other starter deck for like all the duels pretty much. So uh, yeah, there's a few other things going on. So lore wise, I'm not going to over explain the actual lore of this. We it's, it's a Yu-Gi-Oh game. We've been summoned to sure. the Stonehenge. Yeah. And it's like, this is the War of the Roses in the 15th century, and we have to collect cards to ritual summon some Welsh mythological figure. So that's the plot of this game, pretty much. It's, uh, As one does, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, very, very normal <laughs> things. It, it is not canon. It absolutely is not canon. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. The, the funniest thing, I guess, is that Yugi is Henry VII. So he's the father of King Henry VIII, which some people might know of that. And he will tell us that soon. Also, apparently in this game, uh, my Valentine is Yugi's mother, so I don't know. I thought some people might find that as a little entertaining uh, little fact. Quickly before we, we start. too much about her. Yeah, she's, uh, I don't know. She's not quite the difference of age that a, a mother would be uh, in, in context. I don't I know. See. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, so they just kind of had a lot of uh, creative liberties with this game. So before I uh, select the side and we start the timer and everything, I will quickly explain that the any percent we do both sides. The difference of the side selection it determines a value on some of the like the first duels on either side. So we select the red row side first, the Lancastrian side, because this will make the first two duels on this side on easy mode effectively rather than hard mode. Um, so if we're ready, I can count down to start the timer. Yes, absolutely. Alrighty. Three, two, one, go. Let's go. Good luck, Clovis. Thank you very much. I'm going to need it. This is a very RNG heavy run. This really <laughs> is so RNG dictated. So if anyone has any blessings in the chat they would like to give me, I'll take every ounce of them. Yes, many really. blessings. Any, any prey, even the, the default emoji. So here is where... Yugi basically contextualizes that he is role-playing as Henry VII. He literally says that he finds the name Henry VII tiresome, so you call him Yugi. I'm sure Henry VII actually said that, <laughs> uh, you know, in the 15th century. But uh, one thing they explain is that you need a deck cost lower than all the opponents in this game to duel them. And... Because all the starter decks start off higher than the lowest opponent's deck cost in the game, we have to edit our deck at some point in the run. So to get back at the game for making us do that, we're going to enter in passwords. I know this sounds ridiculous, but the password is a carryover from Forbidden Memories where you had to pay. But in this game, you don't have to pay. So we get all these cards for free. We can't actually enter in any card we want. Uh, there are restrictions on some really powerful cards, so we just can't enter them. And the deck cost system, we have to add in low deck cost cards or else we just, we can't actually progress through the game. So we're going to take out all these chunky cards and add in some lower deck cost, high value cards. So I'm going to eject 13 cards. I do have the password list on my screen. I definitely don't want to make a mistake in that regard. So the first card I'm going to enter is Dimensional. We already talked about this card and we should see it throughout the run. Uh, we start with one, but now we have two. And then we're going to enter in three cards called Labrickers. So what these cards do is move through a Labyrinth tile, where uh, normally we can't move our leader 
our deck leader or any of our monsters through Labyrinth Tiles. So we would definitely see this throughout the run. And so what these cards do is let us cut straight through those tiles. So we enter the Cannon Soldier. I'm going to enter an Adama Cannon now. And then a Cannon Soldier. And uh, these also are useful for other things. We can fuse them. And all these cards are strong on Wasteland, which is good. So most duels we're looking for a gap closer, we either want a Dimensional or a Lab Breaker, depending on what's on the field. So if there's Labyrinth in the middle, we want to see these cards in the open account, like, all the time. And then after this, speaking of terrain, I'm going to add in a Wasteland, a copy of Wasteland. And all the field spells do in this game is you flip the field spell face up, and it just puts terrain on the field. And terrain advantage is huge in, huge in this game, and I don't really need to contextualize it now, because we'll definitely see it. Some of the fields already have uh, the field we're strong on. If it's a field such as the Crush Tile, this is what the Slate War is for. This is a fast password, I'll have to contextualize this later when we enter a duel that has Crush on the field. Gonna, and uh, this is like... This next card is like a get-out-of-jail-free card, Mooka Mooka. So this gains 300 attack and defense for every single monster in our graveyard. So if we're very deep into the duel and we have like at least 12 monsters in the graveyard, it will destroy someone in one hit. Uh, so it's a very, very good card to have for something like a very Ooh, yeah, RNG heavy run. It's very powerful. Uh, hopefully we get to see it hit big numbers in this. Uh, then I'm going to add in some consistency cards. So this dinosaur I'm adding, Mammoth Graveyard, will fuse with any zombie in the whole game to make the highest attack zombie in the game. And then we're going to add in Dragon Zombie, which is the best, most reliable zombie I can always play out of the hand. This will defeat opponent in two hits if it's on strong terrain, which is also a very nice property about it. Uh, and then the last three passwords are going to do also very heavily, like, consistency base. I'm missing a password. What have I not entered? King Tiger Wangu, there we go. So I will call this card KTW because it's a bit of a mouthful. This monster moves two tiles when it's face up, regardless of whatever uh, field it's on. And this actually matters a lot. We'll see the terrain boost throughout the run. So we enter in these passwords, and then I'm doing three more. These are all going to be power-up cards, which are known as the Equips. Uh, like the equip spells in regular Yu-Gi-Oh. I'm entering in Megamorph. This will add 300 attack and defense to any monster in the game. So it just gives me more damage. Then I'm going to enter in Violet Crystal, which will give any zombie 500 attack and defense. And then I'm going to enter in Dark Energy, which will give uh, all... Like, all zombies in this game are actually uh, dark attributes. So we can use the Dark Energy on all of our zombies and then also some of the other cards we have in the deck. Such as two of the three lab breakers we entered in are dark attributes, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna make sure I don't get the password wrong. Gotta always like double check. And then uh yep. So now our deck cost is 755. The lowest deck cost in this game of an opponent is 757. So as long as our as long as we edit the deck once throughout the run to have 757 deck cost or lower, we can just play the rest of the game without the game forcing us to edit our deck again. So Oh, nice. Yeah, that, that will be helpful. It does work out. So we have to edit the deck anyway, so we do the password thing. And you do it at the start, so you have the best deck possible um, within reason. So this first duel, I want to see Dimension All immediately. If not, I have to play a strategy of just strong cards. So what I'm actually going to do here is I am just going to send a any card that has like a movement boost here. Luckily, the card I have is over 2,000 attack. I'm going to send it up this side, and I'm going to move to the left. So when I have two monsters, face up charging towards him he will be locked out of playing monsters and he will only look for spells so hopefully i can draw something 2000 attack or higher here i can actually so i'm gonna go ahead and play i'm gonna fuse a zombie with a warrior and equip this will be 200 and, sorry 2200 attack now because this is stronger than my dragon zombie i play it up otherwise if it was weaker i played up the left so i put up this middle tile and then i keep pursuing him now if you're a human, you'd probably would want to move away from my dragon zombie, but he doesn't want to move into the tile that the uh, skeleton is two tiles away from because the skeleton is a higher attack. So now he just stays there. I can attack over these cards. That would just be any spell or trap that he has. And we know that he can only open with 2100 on his first hand. When I mentioned we started on the red rose side, he can't play power up. So that was actually the highest attack he could possibly play. Hopefully he didn't top deck Eternal Rest, that would kill the run. Alright, it's Red Medicine, that's okay. So if he actually wants to play Eternal Rest, that would literally just destroy the run. And if you were doing like world record attempts or whatever, you would absolutely restart and skip three minutes of dialogue again. He didn't, he healed, so I can't OTK him. If he did not play the 
red medicine there, I would have enough to lethal him and I would win. So at this point, as long as he doesn't play a turn or rest, we would just attack him once more the next turn. And this is another, like, you know, the whole run is RNG, but basically that one thing, even though it didn't kill the entire run, lost us a whole turn. So we're just forced to attack him a third time because he regenerated 500 life points, because that was the only card he had available to play that he wanted to play. Um, and the whole, like, everything is like this. I'm just really glad we didn't get a turn arrested so we could just get past this guy, because he's one of the most likely <laughs> yeah. people we are to lose uh, to, uh, in all honesty. Oof. So you win. we've. Hmm? Go ahead. I said, you win. <laughs> exactly. You'll see that box uh, 21 times in the run. That's 21 duels. Oh, so yes. I'm excited. 20 more. <laughs> Uh, there's a slot real graveyard game at the end there, but we've already added the deck, so we don't really need to bother about that. So we just mash through that. Um, up next is Weevil. So he's another like choke point, reset point. So his whole field is uh, forest. And so we can't really just do... We don't have innate terrain advantage. So we need to draw something strong on forest, or we need dimension hole, or we need to change the terrain. There's like our three options. Uh, with a Mooka Mooka as a backup, that card always like gets you out of jail, basically. But again, I don't know what I'm going to be doing until I open with my hand. So we're going to move forward. I'm going to play card top left. Hopefully it's a forest fusion. I just got to see what I have. Um, and I have a dimensional, which is really, really cool. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. So this closes a gap, and you'll see this in action right now. So I move it on the first turn, and then I activate it when I like move it and activate it the next turn, and then move my deck leader if I need to. But you can see already within the second turn, we're going to be right in front of him and we're just going to attack him directly. And when you attack someone directly, you deal the attack points that you have here uh, as direct damage. So you see at the, the top corners, he has 4,000. I'm going to deal 1,900 with a bean. I hope you guys like eating beans. We might not see Bean Soldier again, so I'm glad that I was able to uh, <laughs> bring out the beans. So. <laughs> wow, Bean Soldier. I wouldn't yes. have expected that, actually. <laughs> it's Yeah, if you if you say Plant with a War, you get Bean Soldier. It's a very intuitive fusion. Now, oh, I'm actually okay. really lucky here. So that's the highest attack card I could play. That's the only thing you could open with that would actually uh, kill me in two hits. And then what he did there was he played top right, so we know that's not a trap, so I can just go ahead and attack him again. Again, if my Forest Fusion had 2,000, he would already be gone, but I don't. So I have to attack him just once more with anything that's lethal. And luckily, I got a three turn on him, which is also very good. And yeah, very, very good to showcase immediately Terrain Advantage and Dimension Hole, because some duels, you don't actually have that. And um, oh my god, we're getting to the hardest duels now. Well, not the hardest duels, but the next one is Pegasus. I don't know if any of you guys played this game before and remember Pegasus, but he's like the bane of casual players' existence. So uh, this is one of the duels that's really tricky. If I don't have a gap closer really early, we are actually in quite a bit of trouble. So uh, hopefully we just see a Dimensional Hall or a Lab Breaker ASAP, and then we want to see a Terrain card. His side of the field is all tune. You'll see there's like this aisle that's like a rainbow gradient with a book on top. This is the Toon Terrain, which it specifically, it will weaken every single monster in the game that isn't specifically like mentioned to be strong on it. Um, and we only have one card that's strong on it, which is Saga the Dark Clown that has 600 attack. Um, so we want to change the terrain, like pretty much every tool. So in usual fashion, I'm going to be checking for a gap closer. And if I don't have them, I just need to like get rid of everything in my hand that's not going to be useful. So. I'm going right. to see if I have a Lab Breaker straight up, and I do... Oh, I do, I do. Nice, awesome. So, nice, I actually nice. have to make sure I don't uh, put the Rock and the Zombie together, or else it would fuse my Rock away, and I would not be able to use this effect. So I'm able to use the Insect there to break up that fusion. So we cut through the middle. He plays top left. Now, he moves it to the right immediately, so we know that's a trap card. He has five traps, but he prioritizes them, so we know that's a trap card. I have to get that out of the way anyways, so I'm just going to do that. My Balrog's done its job. It's not really useful to me anymore, so... Sorry, Balrog, I love you, but you've already been... Uh, you've done what you can, yeah. so... Um, you this see is... Buddy. Yeah, I mean, we just need him to break the Labyrinth tile, and then we're all good. So, he's done his job. Now, I'm going to put a non-monster over, which... It's oddly specific, but if he plays another trap card, then I can trigger that trap card with this. Hopefully, it is... Alright, it's not actually a trap card, so this should be a spell. It's Tremendous Fire, this deals a thousand damage to us. So, it's a bit scary if he plays all of those, but uh, either way. We're gonna move forward, and I have Sagi. Now, I don't... I'm looking for other cards. I don't really have too much in the sense of, like, what I could be playing here. 
So what I'm actually going to do is attack him directly with Soggy. Now I'm keeping the Zombie and the Mammoth because that will create a great Mammoth of Gold Fine, which would be 1700. So if I can follow up attack with Soggy, that will deal 2200 across two hits. And then I would only need 100 more attacks. So if I draw any of my power-ups that will go on the uh, Great Mammoth next turn, I will win here, which is really, really good. Otherwise, we'll have to keep like chasing after him effectively. So hopefully, just get a we draw into a um, a equip. There you go, awesome. So yeah, Mammoth Graveyard fuses with any zombie to create 2200 attack. Great Mammoth. It's weakened to 1700. So I needed to equip it there to do lethal, and we just defeated one of the like most top duelists in the whole game in four turns, which is pretty cool. Wow, bravo! I know. I, I, very lucky. I mean. Luckily, when you draw really good cards, it's actually a lot easier, like way easier than trying to play if you don't have good cards immediately. So having good draws not only is faster, but it actually like it just makes it really stress free to play a lot of these duels. So like if I didn't draw so, into that terrain card, it's a bit scary. So Right. So at the beginning, when you're selecting all of these cards, is this kind of the norm for uh, the Yu-Gi-Oh runners to select like all the same cards usually? For the most part, yes. Like there are some cards okay. that are really not up for debate. Like absolutely, some of the duels, the fastest way to beat them is the lap breakers. And entering three, it's like you could enter two, but three just means you're more likely to open with it. Um, oh, another yeah, okay. thing is like you don't have to. For example, I eject a basic insect out in dark energy. That's a consistency card, but unless that saved you time, it actually loses time entering it. So if you're really down to crunching, it gets. Uh, you have to really think about your deck edit. But most of the cards, most runners enter. All right, so I do already have a Lab Breaker, which is really, really handy. So again, I'm going to use the Obese Marmot of Nefariousness, the Beast to break up a fusion. I wouldn't fuse into it anyway, but um, I'm chaining my other fusions because even though it's slower overall, it will generate more damage for Mooka Mooka if I draw into that. So with the Balrog here, again, he has three rows of Labyrinth. We just would have to move all the way around the side. It would take minutes to move around this, but luckily I opened the Lab Breaker again and we're able to just move through the middle. So he, this AI specifically will, what he does is match my position vertically. So now that I'm here and I just keep moving forward, he shouldn't move out of the way unless I make him do that basically. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm trying to draw a lot of damage. I need to kind of get the job done when I uh, close the gap finally and I'm actually at his deck leader. Otherwise it gets a bit scary. So I'm hoping to draw a Mooka Mooka or something like a Mammoth with some equips or whatever. I'll be able to attack him with the Balrock for a thousand. And then hopefully I can follow up with 3k or higher because he has 4,000 of course. So I'm going to keep ditching stuff. Um, at this point, you probably argue that maybe I should be holding on to some of these cards to try to play it safe. But if I don't have lethal and he moves away and responds by destroying one of my cards, it actually gets really obnoxious and like really terrified. So. Um, I'll probably just keep drawing just to like guarantee that I have lethal before I actually go on the attack here. I'm in a pretty comfortable position. I can probably take another turn or two, depending on what he plays now. So um, I'm gonna move this forward. He shouldn't react to it right now. And um, hmm. how do we go about this? I don't really have much damage. I can attack him next turn though. And then. Um, I can follow up attack with something, and we'll see. We'll see how this goes. We don't really know exactly what we're playing until we draw stuff, so even though I was really hoping to get more damage, it's not really worked out that way too much. So I'm going to take the free hit with Battle Rock for a thousand damage regardless. I really should just be doing this. Um, and then hopefully draw into something more strong like next turn would be good. So I actually have 3k here. So... I am going to uh, use this attack, just as much damage as I possibly can play, because it is safer overall to just have as much damage as I can. I can't lethal him, so he will move away after this, and it's actually a bit scary. But if I have anything strong now, if I draw into Mooka Mooka all of a sudden, or he, if he doesn't destroy this, I'm fine. Like, he plays out of the way. As long as he doesn't destroy my Pump King or move in the way, we're fine. If he moves in the way, it's a bit of a problem, but... Again, we don't really know exactly what's going on. He's moved away, so that's really good. He shifted, which, um, this could really help us. Alright, that doesn't do anything. That didn't do anything. So he actually just has nothing on the field that's really strong. So he's just gonna move away. And we are fine. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure I have lethal here. Alright, cool. So, 
Luckily, he didn't actually respond with any high attack monsters, and that is possible if he just doesn't draw any or he keeps playing low attack monsters or whatever. And once we've closed the gap, we lethal him with the whatever is enough damage, so uh, yeah. Again, without opening with a, a Lab Breaker or a Dimension Hall, it's, uh, you're not really likely to kill that guy, or defeat him rather, to use a more polite term, uh, very quickly, so yeah. Well, nice job on the overkill. That was a good one. Well, thank you. I mean, I could have probably just played the dinosaur and attacked him, but I like seeing the giant. <laughs> I like the big numbers. Cool yes. Scene, so. You gotta see the <laughs> two, two, zero, zero, boom, all it's red. It's great. It's awesome. Like, truly, <laughs> just seeing big numbers in this game, I think, is what every person who watched this in their childhood really wanted to see. So, I mentioned earlier, we entered in the password for Slate Warrior. Now is the first duel I can textualize it. So, You'll see these like pinky, reddy sort of uh, tiles on the field. These are called crush tiles. What they do is they will destroy any monster that's 1500 attack or higher on them. And so we enter the Slate Warrior because Slate Warrior is an immortal type monster, which is immortals are exclusive to this game. We didn't draw it, so I still actually want to draw into it. So I keep the plant there because if I play that plant now, I wouldn't be able to play it if I drew into the Slate Warrior. Um, Immortals are exclusive to this game, and what they do is, instead of being destroyed on Crush, they actually are able to, they get a movement boon, uh, bonus and um, attack bonus on Crush. She probably just played a Bolt Escargo, uh, Escargo, I apologize. Uh, I, I don't know why I said that wrong, I never say that <laughs> wrong. But anyway, so I drew the Slate Warrior, which is great, so instead of having to play bosses under 1500 attack, I just attack with this really, like, 2900 attack on Crush, like, it's ridiculous. This card is really, really powerful for a lot of duels, but on the Crush field, this is the best card. This is head and shoulders above any other card on this duel. So I attack directly, uh, and there's other things going on. So the first card I played out the way was so that she moves forward. If I play a card in the middle of the field, like the middle column, she wouldn't move forward. So we let her close the gap, we attack her directly. The mirror wall there doesn't matter because we dealt so much damage on the first turn that I wasn't even worried about that card being mirror wall there. Luckily, she didn't open with that because that would have been really annoying. Uh, if she opens with mirror wall, it just, you lose like a minute no matter what you, you're doing. Ooh. So uh, very good duel that we- there. Very lucky, very lucky that she Moved out of the way and played Mirror Wall after we had Slate Warrior, so uh, that duel was fine. Whew. That duel was absolutely fine. Good, Something's good. gonna go wrong at some point in this run, I know it. It's a very OG <laughs> heavy game, but uh, so far so good, honestly. This is pretty good. I don't actually know what the timer is, but uh, I would don't say it's pretty decent. It. Yeah, I don't even need to worry yeah. about it. I mean, you can kind of get a feel of how decent the run is, <laughs> uh, based on like how many turns you defeat the opponents. So Comicus Keith, uh, quick notice, you'll see he had a um, a... A Union Jack bandana on. The Union Jack didn't actually exist in the 15th century, so whoever did the research in Konami got that wrong. Uh, anyways, oh, shame. I know, I know. Uh, so I don't actually have anything good here, unfortunately. I could YOLO this. Let's just YOLO it because otherwise I just have to restart this duel anyways because this is really not that good. Unless I want to play it super slowly, but this could work. If he plays in front of him, he'll flip up and destroy this monster, but if he plays to the right, his monster is weaker than this. That's actually very lucky. That is actually very lucky. So we played something weaker than 1800. So now I can send this Balrock up, and because my monster is to the right of him, which all the White Rose duelists do this, he actually... Uh, how do I explain this? So, oh, this, this is actually really good. Um, so instead of moving to the left to move away from my monster, his bias to move towards the right, all the White Rose duelists are biased to move towards the right. So instead of moving to the left, he moves forward to try to start moving to the right to get around my monster, which is really interesting. Uh, so that closes the gap so we can attack it with Great Mammoth. And this is unironically like one of the fastest ways to beat this guy. I think this is actually the fastest strategy to beat this guy, if done what? optimally. So <laughs> with uh, Lab This Breakers, is going wild. This is actually very, very good so far. So with the terrain advantage of the Lap Breaker, we're able to beat him in three turns. I couldn't really ask for a better duel than that, in all honesty. Like, that was really good, so... So far, so good. Wow. Mm, and very, and very you were happy. worried you would have to reset that one. You win. Again. I know. I, I totally, <laughs> like, if he opened with anything higher than 1800 attack, he would have absolutely played in front of him, destroyed our monster, and we would just have, like, no play. Uh, we could try to play on, but it is, it is always awkward if you try to play on, uh, sometimes to the point where, like, a very long duel when it's drawn out 
there's like compound time loss. The more like cards the opponent has out, they keep moving them and you lose a lot more time. And uh, so sometimes it's actually better to just exit the duel and go in and get a really good one. So mm, yeah. Darkness Ruler is pretty unique. He's like the one guy in this whole run where you actually don't want to draw Dimensional or Lab Breakers or Terrain cards, like none of those cards. You just want to draw things that are already strong on Yami because the whole field's Yami. Again, we mentioned earlier about, you know, zombies being very good in the campaign. You can see how many fields already have, like, Wasteland and Yami. So hopefully we have a decent amount of damage. Now, the annoying thing here is that... So because all those cards are for summoning power, if I only, if I play the KTW this turn, that's four stars, I wouldn't be able to play those other monsters next turn. I wouldn't have the summoning power for them. So I have to just get rid of them. I have to get rid of everything there that isn't useful. So behind him... He usually plays a trap card. It could be a monster, but it usually is a trap because he prioritizes trap cards. I'm just going to check to make sure I have a lot of damage. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try for a two turn. If that card behind him is a trap card that is not Gorgon's Eye, uh, our KTW won't be able to attack. But if that is a monster, then we would absolutely just, uh, just uh, two turn him. So we attack with a weaker card first so that I still have this really powerful guy. This 3200 attack which uh, hopefully doesn't destroy this, because that would be very, very bad. Uh, so he should move back and then play something else. We'll see what he plays. Oh, he moves to the right, he plays behind him, that's fine. So he defends with that. Um, we don't know if, that, if that's a trap card or not. I could YOLO attack him with that. I just want to make sure I have 800 attack. But I'm going to attack actually with the Dokorozo, the Grim Reaper, which this card has a special effect of it attacks through short-range traps. It's not. It doesn't trigger the short-range traps. So if I attacked him with either of those cards and he had a trap behind him, I it would get destroyed or spellbound, and I would be able to attack him with the other card there anyways, because starting first in this game is really overpowered. We just always have like one card advantage, and they can only really respond one card at a time. So um, that was a pretty good duel, as long as that guy's like three turns or even four turns, it's fine. And then yeah, um, not a bad scenario there at all. Really, it was fine. Uh, I go for the two turn there because it's very fast, obviously, but. Uh, in that situation, we had the backup that if he did have a trap card, we're still able to win that in three turns, which is better than any result other than, obviously, the two-turn that we went for. Now, we oh, go into Necromancer. His name's Bones in the anime. They hadn't had a real name for him yet, I guess, so they call him Necromancer because he's like the zombie duel. We wanted to mention Hole, otherwise we'll be doing a specific setup on this guy with uh, the position of our cards really matters a lot here, so... I actually have Dimension Holes, that's pretty cool. So I'm actually going to get rid of cards that I don't think I'm going to need. And we activate Dimension Hole rather than leave it face down in case he plays a Dark Hole, which he could just Dark Hole this off the field. So we activate this now. The only thing I need to do now to win this, like 99% of the time I'll win if I have a uh, any card that's strong on Wasteland that is 2,000 attack or higher. So I move forward, and now with the, again, the terrain boost, I can go ahead, of course, I have... I don't even need to equip this, I actually don't need to equip this. But as, uh, just the more damage is better, like if you were to block me here for whatever reason, I could move down and attack, so it's whatever. It takes you one second to equip something, it doesn't really lose that much time, but... Um, what he does now, is he keeps moving to the right, and then he plays the monster to the left, so you might be thinking, oh, he's gonna block me, right? Unless this monster is Pump King, the King of Ghosts specifically, he actually, he just moves that out of the way. So we can attack him again. Because the AI in this game are amazing. <laughs> They're really, really good. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he, you, if you were human, you would absolutely block and defend there. But no, he just... I don't know. I, we couldn't really explain exactly what's going on. My guess is he's just... His monsters prioritize my leader to try to attack me and ignores what I have on the field. But it helps us out a lot there. So that's really, really cool. And uh, so far, so good. I don't really think anything's gone wrong. So I feel like, I don't know, Richard... All right, coming up next is King Richard III. Yes, we are fighting <laughs> a historical figure. I can't believe it. Oh, uh, wow. Crazy, right? So this is a very intriguing duel. So he's very volatile, I would say, in regards to... He can give you a very easy duel, or it can actually be quite difficult. What I'm looking for that's like the safest thing here is a terrain card. His whole field is... Basically, like, the whole middle area is meadow which doesn't weaken us, but it strengthens all of his stuff. And because he has a lot of monsters around our attack range, activating a terrain card on this field actually just means the difference between pretty much everything we play uh, losing to his monsters versus everything we play defeating all of his monsters. So this is one of the duels where, again, I just kind of need to hopefully draw a terrain card or a gap closer. Otherwise, we just kind of have to play on the fly and hope for the best, hope we draw to good cards. 
Luckily, I actually have a terrain card already, so I'm going to play it up the left here. If I play it up the middle, he would play a monster right. Oh, I'm supposed to activate the I No, I'm not. I'm fine. I'm fine. So he plays as a trap hole. I got a bit worried there. I was like, I did something wrong, but no. He would play... If he had a monster, he plays it in front of him, and then he moves that over to the right tile. He wouldn't attack me there. So what he just did there is he played top left and moved that down. That is an acid trap hole. We know that for a fact because that is how that is exactly how he plays his um his trap cards, and the only trap card he has is actually acid trap hole. So acid trap hole destroys any monster that attacks it or goes near it. That has four thousand attack or lower, which is a lot. So uh, we kind of want to get rid of that. So I check my hand to see if I've got more damage than this. If I don't, I'm going to use a monster next turn to get rid of that. Otherwise, I'll use my wood remains to get rid of it and then attack him with another card. So I check first off. I really have nothing. This is actually kind of sad. Uh, I'm really drawing a lot of nothing at this point. Like, it's way too late for um, Dimensional to be impactful here. But I have to get rid of this to get a free attack in. So I'm going to get rid of the Acid Trap Hole so I can attack him directly. The unfortunate thing is he is on Mountain, which weakens... Zombies, so I only do a thousand attack here, which is really not a lot. I really do need to draw into more damage after this if I want this to be a good duel. But worst case scenario, we still have uh, Yami on the field, so it's still playable. This is a really unlucky duel. Like, he's playing a lot of damage, and I really didn't draw any damage, which is a bit of a shame. The good thing here is he moves his monster out of the way to attack mine, so as long as I have a lot of damage next turn, we should be fine. I'm going to go ahead and move to my left in case I need to move the turn after this. And um, I actually have exactly 3,000, I believe. So that's very convenient. Um, so yeah, even though I only like fusing the dragon zombie, so dragon zombie fuses with any zombie in the game that is a lower attack to make skill gone. That's 2,200, sorry, 1,700, boosted by 500 on the Yami, boosted by 300 with the Dark Energy, plus 500 with the Violet Crystal, and that's exactly 3,000 there, which is just very convenient. I obviously could not have planned for that to be exactly lethal, but... Yeah, hey. that's wild. Exact numbers. Very convenient and very lucky there, because that was a bit of a scary duel. But as I mentioned, yes. we had the terrain there, so that was fine. <laughs> All right, so coming up next is actually one Ooh. of the few duels we could actually defeat in two turns. Um, so coming up next is Seto Kaiba, which I know everyone loves Seto Kaiba. He's everyone's favorite character. Um, so, the setup for this guy is actually to, like, the, the optimal way to beat this guy is to play the highest attack possible monster in the middle of the field, and then he's going to do one of three things. So, if he can't play a monster on his first turn, he will play to the left and move to the right. Like, that's just how it is. Uh, but if he plays a monster, he usually, he wants to play it in front of him, but if the monster he wants to open with is weaker than the card we have in the middle, what he does is he plays out of the way to the next available tile, which is clockwise. He'll play it to the right, which will block his normal path where he moves to the left. Uh, sorry, to the right. And then, because his path to the right is blocked, he moves forward two spaces right in front of our monster. So ideally, I get the highest attack monster possible, and he wants to play a monster that's weaker than that, and then we can defeat him in two turns, potentially. If I don't have any good openers, or I don't have, like... I'm not confident. I mean, the safest thing I can do is actually play Dimension Hole, which then you'll forget everything I said, but that is a safer option. But if I don't have to mention all, the only, like, the best play I have is to just play whatever the highest stack card I have is, uh, monster-wise. So, this is where we need some of the most luck. This is one of the most RNG heavy runs in the whole, uh, RNG heavy duels in the whole game. So, uh, we Fingers need a lot of Fingers crossed for this, yeah. Fingers crossed. Pray in the chat, please. <laughs> we need a lot of damage, and we also need him to want to play a monster. Um, otherwise... It's not going to be good, and I will actually exit the duel and go back in. If I have Dimensional, I'll play that, but I would rather do the two-turn. I'd rather show that off right now, so... Alright, so this is not good at all, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> oh, actually, well. <laughs> this, is, this is okay. This is okay. So I have 1800 attack, and if I draw to a zombie, I could two-turn him, but he has to move forward here, and I have to draw to a zombie. So we need him to play to the right. All right, so because he played to the left, he was never going to move forward. So I just have to, like, the fast way to do this, honestly, is to just exit out and go back in. And yeah, so if you're going for world record attempts, this is, that's the run's over. Like, it's just over, basically, so. 
Very, very, so, uh, very RNG heavy game, of course. So you have been speedrunning this game for quite some time. Like, how many attempts do you think you have put in over the course of your running this? So across like the last six months to a year, in any percent, I've done two thousand two hundred and something runs. That's what it took to get the world record. Is like you know RNG wise, just continuously rolling, trying to play as good as you can and uh, maximize like what you get via luck. Wow, yeah, that puts a lot into perspective, friends. Don't forget that there's uh, three minutes of unskippable dialogue. So I've skipped uh, I don't know <laughs> like a hundred hours of the intro like in the last half a year, which is a lot. So oh, oh wow, <laughs> yeah, you're you're not kidding. <laughs> It's a lot. It's a lot of uh, dialogue skipping. So again, he played to the left, he was not going to move forward here. And like, if I were to be playing badly and missing opportunities, I would be a bit worried. But this is pure RNG, there's like nothing else I can really do here. So I'm really not bothered. Uh, just hopefully it takes one or two more tries instead of another 10. Otherwise, we'll all be sitting, uh, waiting. It's like a giant loading screen, basically. But we had a pretty good monster there to open with. But if he doesn't want to open with the monster, he's not going to move forward. Now you can play him out the slow way, but it's very RNG based. You do need like a Labyrinth Breaker, and it's so slow that you're actually just better off restarting and going back in. Like you're more likely to have a good duel than you are to finish it off and have that be very good if you don't have like a good opening setup for it. So try again and again and again. This time around, I'm actually going to, I'm going to fuse two monsters together and ditch a third one to generate as much damage as I possibly can for the Mukka Mukka in the hand because that's the highest attack that we can achieve here. Um, this is, I'm not too confident on this, but... Finally, okay, so he wanted to play a monster there and it's weaker than our card, so that's what he does. He plays to the right, he blocks his path, and he moves forward. So then we and get to attack him for free. Just difficult, yeah. you know? He j yeah, he just, uh, sometimes he's a bit shy. Uh, this is really good that we have this. Because after I have 1800, again, I conveniently have exactly 2300 by equipping a Skelgon. So this is a two-turn kill that I did want to demonstrate. And ideally you would get this on the first duel, but you can defeat, like, out of all the duels in the game, Kyber is one of the people you can defeat in two turns with this manipulation setup. So that's exactly how that duel's supposed to go, which is really, really nice. After the two losses, of We course. got there. We, we got, got there, there. finally. Awesome. We yes, got there. you win. Yes. <laughs> Again, the you win box is great. And then it shows a picture of the blue vampire guy. Patrician of Darkness. Classic. <laughs> Love him. Take that, Seto. Uh, he's gone. He's He looks very disappointed if you see in the corner. He's very, very sad. Well done, duelist. Oh, he, you can tell Seto's just tricking you. He's like, uh, he plays, a, he's, he's, <laughs> he's a bit funny here. Look. See, he's all smug now. He's all smug now. So... He's basically giving he, us, like, he, he just said, oh, this was all part of his plan, and now he's going to summon the big bad boss. Ooh, okay, the great summoning. Yes. The screen's shaking. Oh, this is oh, dramatic. It's shaking. Oh, shit. Oh, I shouldn't have sworn. Sada was like, I needed you, Clovis. Where were you? He did. So he acts like <laughs> this was all according to plan, and now he summons... I can't pronounce it, I'm not Welsh. It's like Manaidan Fablier or something. Uh, it's a Welsh... Mythological figure. Good attempt. It's it's oh, okay. relatively accurate for an Australian, I would say. This is the final boss, and we see him on both sides. He's on this side and the other side. So this is actually the easier boss. So this boss is very spell focused. If we get really unlucky, he could actually um, reduce our life points to zero by playing a bunch of burn cards. Otherwise, we've got all this crush in the middle of the field. So we want to see Slate Warrior or a terrain card. Worst case scenario, we just want to play cards as close to fifteen hundred attack without going over. So I'm not too worried about this guy, and if you lose to this guy, it's usually like heavy RNG. So we got Slate War immediately, so that's really good. Uh, hopefully we get a three turn here. So he plays a card in front of him. He moves it forward, and then he moves his leader forward, because this should be a short range trap. There you go, Gravity Bind. Um, so we just get that off the field, which is why I actually started with a monster in general. And now I can go ahead and play Slate Warrior on top of this. And attack him directly. So yeah, normally, again, Crush, if you have anything 1500 attack or higher, you could not play it on Crush. But Slate Warrior is very powerful, and it's also an Immortal, and it's strong on Crush specifically. So very convenient that we saw this on both of the Crush duels so far, because we can actually defeat this guy in two hits. So this could be a Mirror Force, potentially. Hopefully it's just a, a monster. 
That's it. So we beat the final boss of the game. One of the two final bosses of the game with like one card effectively in two hits in three turns. Wow. So very Easy. lucky we drew that. Yeah, very lucky we drew that. That first half was really good. I'm very, very happy with that. So, um, yeah. You win once again, Clovis. We win. I can't believe it. I can't <laughs> believe it. We win. Apart from having to go back into Seto Kaiba twice, everything about that was honestly really good. Like, I'm very, very uh, happy with the luck that we got. So, um, yeah, he's angry. We've banished him back to, I guess, Wales. I don't know. I don't know. So... We will get the credits, but we'll skip the credits. We save the game, and we skip the credits. Um, so, it's just the end of the game. We've sent the evil demon back to the realm, and then Seto Kaiba just goes AWOL. And then we save the game. That way, when we go back to the main menu, we can start the other side of the game, which that will be the second half where we finish any percent. It gives us the password to Fairy's Gift, if anyone's curious what that card is. So we save, confirm, and then we restart the console. If you sit through the credits, it will put you back on the main menu anyways. So by saving and then restarting, we just skip the credits and then we end up on the main menu and then we hit continue and it will, um, it will, uh, yeah, force us to select the other side, basically. It'll skip the name entry and the, like, deck selection. It won't give us the option to watch the tutorial or anything like that. And we're just forced to select the white rose side, the Yorkist side. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. If I accidentally were to hit new game there, the only option really is to restart the console and not do that a second time. Oh, uh, okay. Because otherwise there's like three minutes of dialogue to skip, uh, to exit back to the main menu to load and try that again anyway. So, so you might be wondering, up. by the way, like how is it balanced <laughs> that you... We've beaten the final boss, and now we're starting on the other side. Like, how is this balanced? It's not. So, uh, immediately after beating one of the bosses of the game, one of the two final bosses of the game, we are fighting the duelist that you would be pitched against first off if you initially selected this side. I mentioned earlier that if I have three or more wins, that Rex and Weevil will play power-ups. The first duelist on this side, Taya, has a similar flag, but instead of it flagging power-ups, if I have three or more wins, which I do now because I beat the other side of the game, she will fuse her monsters together, whereas she normally doesn't do that. But this oh. doesn't necessarily make her harder. It actually can be good for us. She will fuse so away. So this is like pretty normal doing these battles uh, in the second half of it, I guess. It's pretty normal. Yeah, so you get used to this fight. Um, and you can actually check the graveyard to see what she fused. She can only fuse Dark Witch or um, Mystical Elf. And you can check the graveyard if you're really not sure and you need to know that information. I do check my hand here to see what I have. Um, I have Dimension Hole. I don't really have a lot of damage, so I'm going to teach you Kazi in the Fiend's Hand. And I'm going to play this Dimension on the middle. So this, having a card in the middle face down generally forces your opponents on this side to play out of the way to the right. Um, that way I can just keep playing through the middle. Now she double fused, so that is guaranteed to be a Dark Witch because she would have had to fuse into a Mystical Elf into a Dark Witch. So we know that that face down card is an 800 attack light fairy vanilla called Dark Witch. So ideally I have more than that. I Hmm. All right, I can still, I mean, I got a decent amount of damage here, I guess. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to make sure I don't accidentally miss Fuse here because that'll be really bad. I'm just going to play as much damage as I possibly can, really. I'm going to attack her directly. Again, she is on a mountain tile which means that zombies are actually weak on that tile. So we get robbed of 500 damage effectively, but um, we could still win next turn potentially. We'll see what we draw. We could draw a Slate Warrior, a Mooka Mooka, or a Terrain card. And we should be able to defeat her next turn. Unless you play the Tears of the Mermaid there. We'll see what we have though. I don't really have anything, so I'm just going to attack her once. I can't possibly defeat her this turn. So I'm going to attack her once, and then I'll just have to follow up attack on the next turn. Again, that's just pure RNG. Nothing else I could have really done there to win, so I just have to attack her again. Even if she destroys this cannon soldier, it's not an issue. I'm just going to play another card. And um, she has a thousand light points, right? So I'm going to attack with a skeleton. I call it a skeleton, it's the zombie warrior. 
Unless I draw a thousand, I can do that, but... Um, so we just do a warrior and a zombie, this will make a 1200 attack skeleton. And we'll win. We'll win. That duel wasn't that bad. If I drew more damage, I would have won a turn earlier. And um, pretty safe overall. Oh yeah, good job on this one. Not bad. It would have been great if it was a turn early, but it wasn't. So, But yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, we didn't really get any of our cards that ruined the whole duel and really punish us heavily. It just took us right. another turn to lethal, so it was fine. All right, so coming up next <laughs> is the easiest duels in the game. And I don't mean he's going to randomly surprise us. Um, the only way this duel is not good is if you just fail to draw damage. Uh, all my goal is is to get a zombie card that has 2,000 attack or higher on the middle wasteland field of this field. Of this map, rather. Whatever you want to call it. And um, if we do that, we'll win very cleanly. There's variations on that, but just having a really high attack zombie, it will just defeat this guy if it's high enough attack. So ideally right, we get a so great mammoth or something. Now. What's that, sir? Battling Tristan now. Yes, Tristan, the easiest guy. He's in London, so... We have a just. I'm gonna play the highest attack possible zombie I can. I'm gonna play a um, dragon zombie here. Again, I use a caterpillar to break up the fusion, so I don't accidentally fuse something else. And um, hopefully, I get either a power up card or a plant or mammoth graveyard. Mammoth graveyard would be the best. And if I get any of those, it should be pretty good. Awesome. Um, I'm also going to equip this because he could potentially attack into me. So if he doesn't attack into me, what I'm going to be doing next turn is flipping up and attacking him, and then turn four, I'm going to attack him again. If he attacks into me and he has a weak enough card, right, he didn't, so don't worry about that, but then I'll be able to uh, defeat him this turn if we dealt 1,300 uh, damage if he attacked into us there. He didn't, it doesn't matter. He cannot play anything that will destroy this, so his only play is to move to the left, He'll play a card in front of him, either move it away or defend with it, and then I attack him again directly. This is the easiest, simplest guy in the whole game. And yeah, once you have a 2000 attack zombie, that duel is done. It's a lock, so... Classic Tristan. Uh, yeah, I guess so. As <laughs> someone in the chat says, Trish Tristan is a complete pushover. What do you think, Chloe? <laughs> it's absolutely correct. He is absolutely the weakest, whether you're speedrunning or casually. He is absolutely, like, no one is even as close to as weak a duelist as he is. And if anyone's wondering why, he has no power-up cards. Like, he has no buffs. And most of his monsters are, like, really just, like, medium stats monsters. So if you have anything yeah. that's, like, above 2,500 attack, he will just never beat your cards. Like, he just won't. So... Tristan's uh, just trying to get by, you know? He is. I think he's pretty comfortable. I mean, it says he lives in a castle in London, but the field suggested otherwise. But anyways, immediately after, the easiest duel in the game comes the hardest duel in the game. So this is great. So Ooh. my Valentine is very difficult in any context. And with a zombie deck, we're weak on this whole field. So we kind of want other cards to help us out a lot. Um, luckily, I do have a Wasteland here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to place, again, this is similar to Teo, where if I have a monster on the, like, any face-down card in the middle of the field, she plays to the right. Now, she just plays stuff that's, like, 300 attack casually without even breaking a sweat, which is annoying. Uh, so we really need to do something about that. So I'm going to go ahead and activate this terrain card up here in this specific tile. And the reason for this is now I can propel my first zombie forward. This will force her to move two tiles, so like Seto Kaiba, Mai can also move two tiles. These are the only two, two duels in the game that can move two tiles. So she moves two tiles to the left, she plays out of the way. The first monster she played will probably destroy my monster, but it's fine. Uh, because I have other backup. But there's Khan on the Sword Mistress, 2400 attack warrior. Crazy. Crazy. It's actually pretty rare that she double equips that. Uh, but it doesn't really matter in this, in this context, so... Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward again. I do need to replace a monster here, so... If my monster survived, I would move that first skeleton on this path specifically. So now that I have a card that has mo uh, movement bonus here, she moves two spaces forward to get out of the attacking range. As you can see, she's very close to my deck leader now, which is really, really convenient. Um, so I'm going to move to my right and make sure I've got some decent damage going for us. Uh, I do. 
Maybe moving the Fiend's hand there wasn't the move, but we'll see. We'll, we only really know next turn if that was an impact, the, if that was like a bad move or not. So um, I'm just going to try to get as much damage as I possibly can in right now. And she'll move two tiles away. She might move two tiles back, actually, now that I moved that uh, Fiend's hand, which is not very good. But this is still fine. This is still okay. Because I have a setup that can actually work here. So she moves that up instead of the left, which is good. So I'm actually going to attack first with this, just in case she just played a trap card there, which she did. So by attacking with this bowl of hands, zombified hands, uh, we get rid of that trap card. So now I can just go ahead and attack her directly with a Slate Warrior. I had the Mooka Mooka there, but I had Slate Warrior, and I know this is going to be a win. So yeah, we... Luckily, I had the card there still to take that trap out. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to leave with Slate Warrior here. So we get rid of the trap, we attack the Slate Warrior, and we win. We'd be the hardest duelist who is not a boss in the game. She is Ooh, top three job. hardest duels in the game, for sure. Along with the final boss, the next final boss. Not the one we beat earlier, but the next one that's coming up in about five duels. Oh, okay. Who's up next? Up next is Marco. Well, they say Mako, but I don't think... like It's based on the... Japanese characters Ma and Ko, so I don't actually think it's supposed right. to be Mako, but I say I say Marco, you know, and it's like Marco. I feel Polo, like that would so. be correct. Yeah, I, I don't know. Mako Shark is like a <laughs> I interestingly pronounced translation. It's not quite accurate, but anyways, up next, however you want to pronounce his name, is the Freaky Fish Man. So he's also pretty difficult. <laughs> not the most difficult he is in the game. Not a freaky fish guy. We'll see. Some people will only ever <laughs> refer to him as that. We'll see if he actually plays Freaky Fish, because he can. <laughs> so this guy is also tricky. He's not the most difficult, but he can be very nasty. Um, it's another. It's actually similar to my in the case that we are just not strong on the field at all. So we really need to close the gap or play terrain. Or it could be a really bad duel. It can be one of the nastiest duels in the game. So hopefully Ooh. we see a dimensional ASAP or a terrain card, preferably Wasteland. Otherwise, I don't know. Fingers crossed, you know. Fingers crossed, absolutely. So I have Mooka Mooka here, so I'm going to fuse away some cards. I'm going to play Slate Warrior with an Equip. Um, I don't really have any good play here. I don't have any terrain cards or anything, so I'm just going to be trying to generate as much damage as possible. So we play the Slate Warrior there with a Mega Morph, just because we have a lot of damage. And he plays to the right. So again, same setup, we play a card in the middle. Face down, he plays to the right. I'm going to check my hand to see what I have. And I don't really have too much, unfortunately. What I could do here, though, is again, if I have a specific setup of the position of my cards here, what I'm going to do is move this up and then move my slate war to the left. And with these two cards set up on the field here specifically, he should play to the left. So that's out of the way rather than playing it uh, in front of him. He usually attacks into this because his cards are quite strong. There you go, Violent Rain, pretty powerful. I'm really not surprised that he defeated us with that first card. I can attack over this, which is good. Because I'll be doing the same setup effectively of what I just did uh, position-wise. So luckily I do have the Slate Warrior with an equip as well, just for a bit of extra damage. I can just get that card off the field so I don't have to worry about it anymore. And just like the previous turn, I'm going to place a card on this tile specifically so that he should not play in front of him. Um, so... This is a bit tricky because I don't really have too many mods in the graveyard, but we're just going to play with it anyways. So he should still play the right here because his left is blocked, but he doesn't play in front of him, which is good. So now I can move forward and attack him directly. He has no trap cards, I need to worry about that. And I'm actually going to move over my Slate Warrior. Sorry, Slate Warrior, I love you, but I need your damage for Mooka Mooka. So I'm going to chain all these fusions. I don't have any fusions, actually. I thought I had a zombie there. That would have been great if I did, but I don't. So I'm going to get rid of every monster in my hand. Each of these monsters generates 300 more attack and defense for my Mooka Mooka. I'm going to attack him directly. If you're really skilled like uh, Gcar2006, shout out to him. He counts all the time, but I never count. So I just YOLO it, and luckily we had enough damage to win there. And that's the magic of Mooka Mooka. We finally got to see Mooka Mooka. Amazing. Yes. 3,900 so attack crab. You just kind of go for it. You, you just win go for it. again. Worst case scenario <laughs> yes. is we'd probably win the next turn after that if we didn't have lethal. So it's worth just attacking oh, him okay. there with as much damage as I can. Especially if I've not counted my cards, which if I open with Mooka Mooka and that's the strategy I want to play, I will count. But otherwise, I'm not guaranteed to draw it. So, you know, when I'm thinking about what is going to be played, what I should play and commentating, I, don't, I just don't count. I just stack everything into the graveyard. And uh, that way I didn't miss out on anything. 
All right. Sure, so, yeah, and I, I want to applaud you on your commentary. This has been really interesting to watch, Clovis, so thank you so much. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me, by the way. It's really nice to yes. have this, uh, my favorite game. Well, actually, I'm sorry, it's my second favorite game. Elden Ring's my favorite, but um, <laughs> one of my favorite games that's of all good. time. Uh, this is the first time it's on GDQ, and that's uh, very, very cool. Very, very cool. It was a long time coming, you know, we... we uh... We talked a little while, Clovis and I, and we, we got it. We got it here. I'm we so did glad. it. We finally did it, guys. <laughs> Team effort. Yes. So previously, we talked about uh, when we had a on Keith. I had a monster to his right side, and he moved forward to the red rose side. If they're biased to move to the left, so if I have a monster to the left side of his leader, instead of moving away to the right, he moves forward to try to get around our leader. So we just send anything strong on Wasteland to get it on that side of him. Luckily, I also have a Terrain card here, and this duel is pretty much already over. So um, we activate the Wasteland so that we have the field advantage on the middle stripe, or column rather. So now what he's going to do is he's going to move forward, and he'll play something, and then I'm going to attack him twice, and then we should defeat him in two turns. So. Uh, as you can see, we're just going to go ahead and attack him. We got 2100 attack with the Dragon Zombie. And the Cannon Soldier we played in the first turn has 1900 attack. Again, um, if I did not change the terrain here, these two attacks would have dealt 1500 less than they're doing now. Uh, because the Cannon Soldier wouldn't be boosted by 500, and the Zombie would be weakened by 500 instead of being boosted by 500. Uh, so, terrain advantage is huge, not just because of the movement bonus there. We've already seen it several times in the run. But yeah, three months. Uh, three, uh, three months? Why did I say three months? Three turns. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> three months is probably how long it would take you to play this game casually for the first time as a kid, I would say. Uh, okay, I, fair. I, fair I, remember, on that. I remember losing a lot. <laughs> I remember giving up very quickly when I played this game when I was seven years old and entering in passwords straight oh away. My gosh. But here we are now. We've learned a lot about the ins and outs of the opponent's AI. So, um, very different story now. Yes, I'll say. Clovis, did you play this game with friends or, or family growing up? So I actually had one friend in, uh, like my best friend in childhood who was really into Yu-Gi-Oh! And we did play this game every oh. now and then. So we've got uh, fond memories of Friday nights of getting a takeout and then just playing this or oh. any PS2 game like Ratchet and Clank or whatever. So um, quickly though, I will commentate on this guy now that we're in this duel. Yeah. So this, most hands win on this guy. Again, I have Slate Warrior on a Crush Duel. This is actually insane that I got it 3 out of 3 times, so I'm just going to unironically solo this guy with a Slate Warrior. Um, so we have the card in the middle, he plays to the right. Now we flip it up. I'll just move in case we can get a 3 turn. We flip it up, and now his only real play is to move to the left. Right? It's going to play in front of him. And then you notice we can now move our Slate Warrior forward and to the right. Well, final flame. Okay, that's good. So I move forward, that's really, really good. So if he blocked there, I would not be able to attack him a second time this turn. But now I can move forward and attack him directly. And if I have enough damage, we can actually defeat him in three turns, which is actually crazy. Like, it's really rare to get a three turn of this guy. And I do. Now, I actually can't, I can't play that Mammoth, or his leader would blow it up. Like, it would actually just be destroyed instantly. So I play a zombie there. And that's a three turn. Like, that's a really good... Shoddy, actually. That's very, very good. Very convenient he played a spell oh, there oh. and activated it. So, yeah. So he far, was, so uh, good. being nice. Yeah, he's being nice to you. I don't even know if I got a Shoddy that good in all of my um, no reset attempts. I'm practicing for this, so... This is some of the best RNG I've got in weeks. Like, <laughs> Wow, let's go. This is yeah, actually very, RNG very nice. RNG has been, has been relatively kind to you, I would say. I don't actually know what time we're at, but... I would be curious. It's it, the pace would probably be pretty decent, apart from the Seto Kaiba. Everything so far has been really good. Nice, yeah. We can talk about it after the run for sure. Sure, sure. Quickly though, we have Grandpa. Who anyone who watches my stream <gasps> knows about Grandpa. So this is the most RNG biased duels in the whole game. There's really no skill to this duel. You just really want to draw a Labbreaker as soon as possible because he's surrounded by like a temple of labyrinths. We want to play a lap breaker to cut through the middle, then attack him twice with a, anything strong. Uh, we didn't get it, so of course, we just have to ditch cards until we draw a lap breaker, and it's still going to be faster than like, anything else it could possibly do, basically. So, um, 
all we need to do is draw a lap breaker. And there's a lot of like little uh, intricacies to the duel, but uh, this is still like the fastest way to do it. Hopefully we just draw it as soon as possible, but the only thing we need to not do is fuse away a lap breaker if we draw it. So this is really good that we have this. I do need to draw something good that's follow up, but with the Dharma Cannon, I can just move straight through the middle. And then the next turn, hopefully I have a zombie because then I can move forward and attack him directly. So he moves forward still. He just kind of wants to sit here and play Exodia pieces in the middle. Um, but he's already actually soft locked himself out of playing Exodia because he's got two other monsters on the field. So we don't have to worry about that at all. You never have to worry about oh, that. Of course, good. we've got Dragon Zombie. So. <laughs> Free hit. And we attack him a second time. And the duel will end. Wow. How upset do you think he is that he didn't get to play Exodia? I think he's used to it. I actually, in my whole life, have never seen him play Exodia. <laughs> I'm not kidding. No way. Grandpa lost his touch? He's gone. That's it. He, he loses. That's why Yugi's doing all the duels lately. <laughs> Yugi did win his deck, and then he got Exodia, and then Weevil threw Exodia off the boat. And uh, that was like the first episode or something. That's a classic. Oh, yeah, he did. Why would he throw it off the boat? He was jealous. I mean, I remember he being was, as a kid, yeah. I was like... Weevil's dumb. Like, wouldn't you just try to trade those cards and get some better cards right? or money or something? Why'd you throw them away? Or like, you know, silly. yeah, or like sell it or something. Exactly. You need to throw it into the abyss of the ocean. He could have rented out like a, a gold class room or something on that boat if he sold those exotic pieces, you know? Oh my god. Alrighty, so final three duelists. Now, this is the guy that he has the lowest bet cost in the game, 757. Uh, so we have to have a deck toss lower than his, which is why we have to edit the deck at some point in the run. This guy, there's like five different strategies we can draw for this guy. Uh, Dimensional, Forest Fusion, Terrain, Slate Warrior, or a Cyberstein. So I just have to draw one of these strategies and hopefully win within four turns is, is the goal. Alright, so immediately I've got... Alright, this is good, this is good enough. I got Wasteland, so we set the card face down the field. He's gonna move forward and play behind him. The only time he ever actually plays uh, in front of him is with a spell, which I could activate my spell over it. So now I'm going to activate the Wasteland in front of this tile after he's moved forward. Now when I move forward, I can attack him with anything that has the terrain boost because I can move through tiles. I have the... I have a beast and a machine. So shout out to Dice Armadillo. We don't always see this card. But this is 2150 attack on Wasteland. So this will actually defeat him in two hits. So after I attack him now, what he'll do is he'll move to the left, and he should play back left, and we just attack him again. And there's really not much he can do about this. So watch him move to the left. He plays back left. Next turn, we attack him again, and very, very ideal Bakura. Uh, doesn't get too much better than this, honestly. The optimizations in duels like this are basically... If I have a Dragon Zombie instead of that Fusion, then I don't have to Fuse, I don't lose like 3 seconds to Fusing. But that is still better than anything else, really. Uh, so that's a very good duel as well. We got a promotion as well! Promotion, cool. That Ooh, doesn't do anything, promote. but... It's funny. Promoted it's to funny the to boss. See. Promotion in this game is a very, like, overlooked feature. <laughs> it takes you... I have timed this, so I came up with the fastest strategy to rank up a deck leader in this game. It takes you, if you're doing it optimally, it still takes you five and a half hours uh, to what? get the max rank, which that, like, you could beat this game five times within that time if you were speedrunning it. So it's not really worth it. So <laughs> don't do that. Oh, don't do God. that. No, don't do that. This is why you're the boss and not an intern. Not you know these boss. things. Well, <laughs> I, I like to think so. I don't want to give myself too many pats on the back. Because I could get destroyed by this guy. I could get destroyed by Yugi. Yugi is... Like Richard, he's very volatile. We could get a really easy duel or a really difficult one. Again, I don't have any idea what I'm going to be playing, but I do want to gap closer immediately. I have the best hand possible for this guy. That is incredible. So oh, let's go. Let's go. We got a dimensional so we can close the gap, and I have a Slate Warrior, which is really, really good. That is a Curse Breaker. So I don't have to worry about that. If he plays in front and he leaves an attack mode, doesn't move it, that's a Curse Breaker. Um, I would prefer if... I was able to play on that, but I'm not. So uh, what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to make sure I have enough follow-up damage here. Or try to. I'm going to hope, hope that I have it. I'm going to attack him directly with a Slate Warrior here. And then if I'm able to attack him for 1600 attack next turn, I will 3-turn him. 
I could have probably actually played this better or ditched more cards. Uh, actually, if I have a plant and a warrior, do I? I can attack next turn with lethal. If I have a plant and a warrior. I don't. So, uh, I've got... Okay, I top-decked the, the KTW. That's enough damage. Even if it wasn't boosted on that forest tile, that's perfect. So, that's great. So, I defeated... The King of Games, the guy with plot armor, he does not have plot armor wow. in this game, evidently. We defeat him in three turns, which is... That's very good RNG, so... I, I actually... I, I can't believe how good the RNG has been in this run. I was right? expecting something to go way worse. Um, but <laughs> this is really good so far. Everything apart from Seto has been actually, like, absurdly good. So... Yeah, we only have a handful of bosses left. We've got one boss left. We have one duel left, actually. Just one guy, and he's actually the scariest guy in the whole game. This is perfectly, like, very climactic. So we summon right, the boss again on this side, and um, so the scary thing about this guy is that he can play a power-up. Both bosses can do this, but it's scary on this guy. Um, he can play a power-up that will halve my life points and add it to his monster. So if he beats my monster with one of his, and he equips it with Ryoku, he will literally OTK us. Like, he just, we're just dead. No matter how good our setup is, he can just OTK us anyways. So. Um, either way, it's similar to Seto in regards that we're going to be trying the same setup all the time anyways. The only exception is if I draw into Dimensional, which I'll talk about Dimensional if I draw it, but the best setup for this guy is actually just sending the highest attack card that's strong on Yami and hoping for the best, really. And it's a very interesting duel. You can beat this guy in three turns, uh, just with like a really high attack zombie. So hopefully we just get a really high attack zombie, hopefully he doesn't dark hole us, and we'll just see what we draw, and hopefully we can defeat this guy. Um... Ooh, and it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be nerve wracking. It's fine. I mean, because the run's been so far so good. I <laughs> if I get destroyed by this guy once, it's whatever. It's a bit of entertainment. Um, the timer will be on the you win box, by the way. When I confirm it, when it's okay. in the middle, and I will say time. But hopefully, that's this duel. So move forward, and uh, I don't. This is really unfortunate. I don't actually have um, a zombie right now. I really do want to draw a zombie. What I'm going to be doing is just playing this mammoth on the field and then hopefully drawing into a zombie. Um, hopefully he just doesn't dark hole this. This could be a dark hole. It is not, so that's very lucky. So I would like to just have a zombie right now and then hopefully we can win. Uh, we do not. We again, we don't have a zombie. That's really unfortunate. That is really, really unfortunate. Um... This is really bad. This is really annoying because we have two equips and no zombie, and I've got a mammoth and two equips and no zombie. But I still really want a zombie. I'm really praying for a zombie because now he's going to play something really scary in front of him. All right, he didn't Ryoku it, so this is winnable. This is winnable. We can check what this card is by checking the graveyard, by the way. Um, so this card is a. All right, it's Black Skull Dragon, so that's 3200 attack. We still do not actually have. We still do not actually have a zombie, which is really unfortunate, so uh, hopefully get one next turn and we can maybe squeeze out a win here. We really need to draw a zombie, like, right now. Ooh. This is a last chance to draw one, so uh, we'll see We'll see what happens here. Okay. Alright, what have I got here? I have a zombie, finally. Oh my god. Oh my goodness, okay. And we have three equips, so this is a pretty interesting situation to be in. We have a lot of damage here. We have a lot of damage. Um, so the unfortunate thing is here, like, this is a situation I'm not fully prepared for. His left and right tiles are occupied, so he might play in front of him anyways, which is really, really unfortunate. If he does, we should just be able... Yeah, he's going to. Uh, we should be able to follow up and, and uh, attack him the next turn anyway, so it's not a big deal. Normally, he has the right side of him free, and he would play out of the way there, and I'll be able to demonstrate a bit better, but um, this is kind of how this duel is working out, unfortunately, so... Um, a bit annoying, but what can you do? I'm going to equip this again, actually. We're just really playing on the fly at this point, because none of the manipulation setup worked. So I'm going to equip that. I should be able to attack him next turn. So what he should do is move away, and then he, he shouldn't block me again. He might. No, he won't. He won't. So he moves out of the way over his card, and he passes. Well, he passes because he didn't have anything to play, I guess. We attack him directly, and then to win, because I still need to do 200 damage, I am actually just going to Ukazi him. Now, the unfortunate thing about this was I didn't really get to demonstrate how a speedrun duel of this guy is supposed to go, because like that, I've never had a duel like that before, actually, but 
we're able to beat the final boss without dying, and the run overall was fine, so I'm pretty happy, and time's coming up in a few seconds, or... Time, there it is. The duel is over, and that is it. That is the whole of Duels of the Roses defeated in whatever the time is on the screen, so, uh, yeah. Richard, Richard, do we have a final time? Clovis, great job, by the way. Oh my gosh. 106.26? Yeah, 106.26, yeah, I guess, that. is the time. I'm very nice. happy with that, actually. Yeah. It's a very solid run. I was uh, So the attempt is, the estimate is 120. World record is 59. Some of best of good players are like 45. Um, I was hoping for yeah. a 110. So like that's how insane the RNG is in this game. And I'm pretty happy overall. So let's go ahead and go to the credits, oh, yeah. I, I suppose. Yeah, let's check out the credits. Very happy with that run. Really, that was minutes faster than I expected it to be, and nothing really particularly went wrong. The only disappointment there was actually the final boss. Even though we beat him deathless, I wasn't really able to showcase exactly how that duel's supposed to go, which is, I find that duel very interesting, but we just didn't really have a good setup for it, and that was a very rare duel, but we beat him anyway, so... I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. Oh, uh, yeah. We got to have at least one that's never happened before kind of moment uh, on GDQ. So, uh, you, you know, you did the assignment, uh, Clovis. Well good, done. Good. <laughs> really happy with that overall. And I'm not even surprised at the Seto RNG either. Seto is now, by the way, lore wise, uh, we've done his favor for him, even though it didn't work out for him. He's giving us a White Rose pendant so that when we get sent back to our time, we uh we can contact his like family line uh if we need support or something so yeah wow that's, that's kind it is very nice so seto is actually the good guy in this game unironically he's like the good guy uh if you if you guys love seto we should like him even more if you know about the the story of this game he's the good guy here absolutely so Aww. he sends us back to our time which yugi doesn't do that he just lives on uh so that's very very kind it just gave us the password to earthshaker and um, we don't have to save, so we're not going to. And that is the credits. We get a nice, like, spinning card thing. And that's Yu-Gi-Oh! Tools for the Roses. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Tippy, as well, for inviting me on. Yes. Wow. I'm oh so glad gosh. that run went well. Wow. Thank you guys for watching. That much run... appreciated. Listen, y'all, Clovis put in so much time working on this run, so I'm glad that the RNG gods were relatively kind to you tonight. Uh, <laughs> Clovis, do you have anything else that you want to say to our viewers before we wrap up tonight's show? Really, just thank you. Like, thank you to everyone. Again, thank you, Tippy, for giving me a chance to showcase one of my favorite games of all time on GDQ for the first time. Thanks to everyone who followed me over from my channel or anyone outside of my channel uh, who just wants to come in and uh, watch a nice speedrun. Yeah, absolutely. I've been hanging out uh, in Clovis's chat while you were practicing and it was a good time so i encourage everyone to follow clovis here on twitch if you had fun with us tonight that is twitch.tv slash clovis senpai but yeah uh, as i said before that is a wrap on tonight's episode of time capsule my friends i have been your host smooth operative thank you all very much for watching for more hot fix, be sure to check out the VODs on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash games done quick. And if you're watching this on YouTube from the future and you had fun with us, be sure to press the like button on the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. For my Twitch watchers, maybe arriving now, if you did miss out on Hotfix tonight, you can stay tuned for the replay of tonight's shows, RNG and Time Capsule, coming up right after the break. We'll be back with the live shows this weekend at 1 p.m. Eastern for speedruns of Castlevania and Silent Hill. Have a beautiful day or night wherever you are in the world, and the Hotfix crew will see you next time.